The thing she always wanted was a horse. Bonnie thought little girls like horses. I'll make a toy horse that has a combable tail and girls can play with it much as they would play with a doll. It should be small and soft and cuddly. This was a doll you played with like a human doll. Marvel was producing animation, My Little Pony, that came out in 1986. My Little Pony, My Little Pony. Oh, My Little Pony. My Little Pony. My Little Pony. I love you, My Little Pony. And the rest, as they say, is history. Level 1 Returning characters On the actual iceberg image, it says returning ponies, but only talking about the pony characters would be leaving a lot out. So, for ponies, you've got Twilight, Applejack, Moondancer, you've also got minor characters, as well as mentions of Firefly. There are others I missed, but feel free to shout out some other legacy ponies in the comments. Spike the Dragon gets repurposed, and so do a couple of the villains from the original My Little Pony and Friends series. T-Rex, Grogar, the Smooths. Although Megan the Human Girl doesn't come back, there is one character who has a cameo in Equestria Girls who wears the same outfit. And I mentioned this in the first iceberg, Lauren Faust, when she was making the 2010's version of MLP, Friendship is Magic, based the characters off G1 MLP toys she had when she was a kid, which include the main six, as well as Princess Celestia being based on Majesty. Although, the main six do have some different names. Like, Surprise became Pinkie Pie, and Sparkler became Rarity. But other ponies like Applejack got to stay. Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito who went on to become sort of a living meme, voiced the Grundle King in the 1986 My Little Pony movie. There's a lay epic screen cap of the movie featuring a squirrel looking stoned off her ass with the name Danny DeVito that gets shared around a lot. As for the character himself, Danny does a good job at portraying him. Seriously, the Grundles were one of my favorite parts of the movie. Megan. Megan Williams is a character who first appears in the original 1984 My Little Pony TV special and is a recurring character throughout the series. She's supposed to be an audience surrogate for the kids watching, same goes for her two siblings, Molly and Danny. The reason she's even mentioned as a whole entry on the iceberg is that humans in the MLP universe aren't a natural occurrence, at least in every subsequent generation. Fans of later generations who haven't really given the old ones much thought might see this connection between the pony world and what is very clearly meant to be our world and think, wow, this is crazy. Though, that's not the only connection to the human world that we have in Ponyland. Megan was also released as a human toy with this human doll, these were packaged in with a pony named Sundance. There was also another release of a baby version of Sundance, but instead of coming with Megan, there was Molly, her little sister. Retro Style Ponies Slash Merch To capitalize on nostalgia and the avid collector scene for vintage ponies, Hasbro's made some efforts to get some G1 related stuff out there as of late. A few years ago, the company Basic Fun licensed the My Little Pony brand to produce the retro style ponies with a near identical look and feel to the originals. Australia had these limited edition G1 style plushies, as well as these fluffier ones made from recycled material. Licensed merch with G1 ponies can be found on anything from stickers to t-shirts to coloring books, you know. Of course, who could forget the world's smallest My Little Pony, released by Super Impulse, and the Funko Pops. Crossover series. Being the licensing giant that it is, Hasbro's put out several collector edition ponies based on different properties. Most of these are from Hasbro's disgustingly corpulent library of IPs. You've got Power Rangers, Transformers, Dungeons and Dragons, Lightbrite, and Twister, with potentially more to come. There's also a Ghostbuster pony, and most interestingly, a color inverted version of Applejack with branding based around Stranger Things, based on the upside down dimension from the show. So, you know, upside down Applejack with upside down color scheme, huh? One more thing, one more little comment, I think it's really a missed opportunity that the D&D ponies aren't the size of actual D&D figures, but what do I know? Bushwoolies. The Bushwoolies are a species of characters from the G1 series. After the ponies save them from an underground prison camp, they sort of just hang around and tag along for some adventures. A lot of the more out there characters from the show never got released as toys. The Bushwoolies are an exception, as you can find these little guys packaged in with a few ponies. T-Rack vs. T-Rack T-Rack, spelled like this, 
is the main antagonist of the first My Little Pony TV special. He would be brought back nearly 30 years later in the Friendship is Magic series, though his name would be spelled differently for some reason. That and he was notably less human looking. Pre-G4 Fandom Before the rabid fanbase and brony subculture that came around in the 2010s, the My Little Pony fandom was pretty different. I've talked about it in a few videos, but pre-Generation 4 in the 2000s, most discussion around MLP was about the toys. Back in the day, you had collector's websites, blogs, and small meetups. The fandom was also predominantly female, with a large number of fans growing up with the original G1. G1.5 My Little Pony Tales is a show that ran in the early 90s. It starred these seven ponies, who were only released as toys in the UK, although the show never aired over there. The Rock and Beat Ponies also had a few cameos as Melody's band. The show is referred to as Generation 1.5 since it's separate from My Little Pony and Friends and features some G1 ponies. It's a common misconception that I still see that the show is G2, when G2 is something else entirely. If you want more My Little Pony Tales content, I made an entire iceberg covering the show. So, go watch that. Shooby Doo. This is the catchphrase of the Sea Pony characters in My Little Pony and Friends. When the Sea Ponies enter a scene, they sing this little thing. Although, Shooby Doo is mostly remembered from the song Call Upon the Sea Ponies, which deserved all the hype it gets. Honestly, that song goes hard. Nothing Can Stop the Smooths. Speaking of songs that go hard, Nothing Can Stop the Smooths is a song from the My Little Pony movie, sung by the witches and the all consuming purple blob, the Smooths. This and the Shooby Doo thing get their own entries because of how they're semi recognizable among fans of later generations. Like, oh yeah, it's that thing from G1. Pony Poses Ponies in earlier generations were molded into several different unique poses, instead of whatever the hell this is in G4 and G5. Unlike the main brushable style ponies now, you'd have ponies with different positions for the head, hooves, and whatever else. Some notable poses include the original 6 collector's pose, the sitting down bubbles pose, and the shy unicorn gusty pose. These poses can be differentiated by the copyright markings on the hooves. Though others, you can just go on any pony identifier website and match it to the one you have. Back card stories. Like a lot of dolls and action figures, G1 ponies would have these blurbs written on a pony on their respective back card or back of the box depending on which pony specifically. These were usually cute little stories about the ponies going out to play or having a tea party, basically what most G4 fans think the G1 show is. They clue the owner into the pony's personality and interests, but not much beyond that. Comparing this to something like Hasbro's G.I. Joe line from the time, the pony back cards leave a lot more room for you to use your imagination. Anime Art Style If you watch the very first My Little Pony special, which for the rest of the video we're just gonna call Rescue at Midnight Castle, if you watch that, you'll notice the distinct anime art style. Big eyes, the shape of the mouths, and the snappy way the characters move. The special was outsourced to Toei Animation of all places, so no wonder it looks like this. Later G1 outings would bring on Acom, a South Korean studio, with them being the only foreign studio to work on Generation 1.5. Seeing the first special makes you wonder what the rest of G1 and the entire franchise would have looked like instead of the more western, Disney-esque look that we'd get. They almost tried it again for G3, but I guess we'll never get a true MLP anime. My Little Pony A New Generation Cameo In the recently released My Little Pony A New Generation movie, there's a brief scene where a scene from G1 is shown on a set of TVs for like half a second. This is weird to see in Generation 5 since that takes place in a world where humans aren't seen in Equestria. Also in G1, Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi are all friends, which isn't the case for most of the G5 movie, especially not during this scene. Also, the window here says 20% off, like 20% cooler from G4. Get it? MLP Generations MLP Generations is a series of comics published by IDW that, as of me writing this, is still going on. The series is a crossover between G1 and G4, featuring ponies from both eras. Throughout the 1980s, Hasbro tried and succeeded with keeping the My Little Pony toy line fresh. They did this by introducing a ton of gimmicks, most of these being different pony species. There's the classic Earth Ponies, Unicorns, Pegasi and introduced in Year 2 of the toy line. There's Sea Ponies, also Year 2, which from what I remember was 
1982 to 1983, I could be wrong. Ponies with butterfly wings showed up multiple times. Flutter ponies in year 4, summer wing ponies in year 6, windy wing ponies in year 7, all basically the same thing. There's even the term wingers, which refers to all three of them as the same thing. Some ponies had gems for eyes. The rainbow ponies came out in year 2 and year 3 of the line with their cousins, the rainbow curl ponies, arriving in year 8. Apparently, the backstory for the Rainbow Curl Ponies is that after helping a rainbow get its color back, they were given magical crystals that gave them rainbow-colored manes. Wow, what a cute backstory. Surely all the other gimmick ponies are like that. Like, you know, they have a cute backstory. A cute, not evil backstory. Foreshadowing. Multi-episode arcs. So, just something I think that should be noted about My Little Pony and Friends, just because it's going to be more confusing when we talk more in depth about the show later, the stories in the show weren't told episodically or through like season-long arcs either. They had these episode-long arcs with multiple parts. Most are 2 to 4 or 11 minute episodes, equaling the length of one 22 minute episode or a 44 minute TV special, but the first one in the DVD release, The End of Flutter Valley, is 10 11 minute episodes and it has no reason to be that long. It drags so much. But yeah, that's why if you go into like the 2B TV release of the show or any DVD, it always says, you know, X arc part 1, part 2, part 3, part 4. Level 2 Gusty is Bart Simpson. Nancy Cartwright provides the voice for Posey, Baby Heartthrob, and Truly in My Little Pony and Friends. She also voices the character Gusty. The voice for that character sounds similar to her most famous role as Bart Simpson from The Simpsons. Anywhere. Oh no, Shady's nothing but bad luck. Hi, Caramba. 3D Symbols Though most of the symbols or cutie marks on G1 ponies are just painted on, there are a few instances of symbols that were 3D models instead. Princess ponies had these little brooches, the Sunday Best ponies had 3D symbols all themed after ice cream, merry-go-round ponies from year 7 had blankets molded onto them in place of a symbol, and the precious pocket ponies from year 9 had coin purses attached to them. Saddles Early playsets like year 2's show stable and Pretty Parlor featured saddles and bridles as accessories for the ponies. This is weird, seeing as how the ponies, for the most part, are autonomous and only ridden by one character, who wouldn't be released until a year later, and is barely a focus of the line. Things like this were phased out in later years in order to broaden the possibilities of what My Little Pony could be, beyond just a regular horse. So in later years, we got things like Paradise Estate, and Ponywear. Glow in the Dark Ponies Despite the name of this entry, the glow-and-show ponies from Year 9 aren't actually completely glow-in-the-dark. Their bodies are translucent with confetti inside, only some of which glows in the dark. Though we never got one, a classic full green glow-in-the-dark pony would have been fun. My Little Pony and Friends, the series, was actually ran in blocks that featured one episode of My Little Pony and another episode of some other Hasbro-based show. This would either be Potato Head Kids, Moon Dreamers, or Glow Friends, featuring that one thing from Big Mouth. There's a VHS release of a few episodes from the UK that also includes the 1983 Charmkins TV special, based on the toy line of the same name. Charmkins was never shown on the My Little Pony and Friends block, so it's weird that they'd include it in this release, but to be fair, it does say My Little Pony and Other Friends, not My Little Pony and Friends. Takara in 1985, the Japanese company Takara produced their own Japanese adaptation of My Little Pony, with different designs and characters. The My Little Pony brand was licensed by Hasbro after Hasbro licensed Takara's Microchange and Diaclone lines, which will be rebranded as the Transformers. Baby Fancy Pants Ponies The Baby Fancy Pants Ponies came out in year 7, and are really only notable for what they canonize in the G1 universe. If ponies need to wear diapers, that means they have to, you know, Prince Pony. Nightshade, formerly spelled either with a K or an N, we don't know, is a prominent character in the Bright Lights story arc of My Little Pony and Friends. It's never been outright stated by any of the show staff, but people theorize that his appearance and voice is based on Prince, a popular music artist from the time. Mimic Rarity 
Mimic is a pony who appears in the story The Magic Horseshoes. Not many of her were produced, which led to her being sought after by collectors. She also has a unique color compared to a lot of other G1 ponies. So Soft Ponies So Soft Ponies were ponies whose bodies had a short layer of fuzz all over them. This is also referred to as flocking. Just by looking at them, you can probably already guess what they feel like. So Soft Ponies came out in Year 4 and Year 5, with one of them being bundled in with a Megan doll. Another, Best Wishes, coming with the My Little Pony Party Gift Pack, and Satin and Lace being a mail order exclusive. European Exclusives There are a surprising number of ponies that are exclusive to Europe or other territories. A lot of them were part of existing waves, like the German Rainbow Ponies, but some others are completely original like the Play School Baby Ponies from Year 8, and Year 9's Romance Ponies. And of course, the Seven Pony Friends from the My Little Pony Tales series, and the Barrytown family, who also appear in My Little Pony Tales, but are called the Barrington family. And as I said in the My Little Pony Tales Iceberg, their daughter has two names. Collector's Inventory. The My Little Pony Collector's Inventory is a series of books published by Summer Hayes, a coordinator for the My Little Pony Fair conventions and, as of 2015, is a contracted promoter for the My Little Pony brand. The book's use is stated in the title, an unofficial, full-color, illustrated collector's price guide to the first generation of MLP, including all US ponies, playsets, and accessories released before 1997. As of this video, there's also a collector's inventory for Generation 2 and 3. Scented Plastic Certain ponies, like the Sweetberry and Sunday ponies from Year 6, and Perfume Puff ponies from Year 7, used scented plastic to give the ponies unique smells. As you can imagine, a lot of these lose their scents over time. Pony Clothes There are a ton of clothes and accessories for G1 ponies to wear. Starting in Year 3, pony wear became a thing, where pony outfits would be sold separately, like most fashion dolls. Other accessories came packaged in with the ponies, like a barrette or a princess crown. Some clothes came with bundles, like the party gift pack, which came with the official My Little Pony party panties. There were also clothes for Megan to wear, including the country jamboree outfit that she wears in most episodes of the TV show. Fact File My Little Pony Fact File was a collection of bios for each pony which came in a small ring binder. The text on each pony's page would usually be identical to the background stories on the UK toy packaging, so nothing groundbreaking or revealing about the world or characters, except for the fact that the Flutter ponies bring good luck wherever they go. The final pages of the fact file have line-drawn template pages for most types of pony, allowing owners to design their own additions to Ponyland. Wow, it's almost like they knew. Wind Whistler Trans People like to headcanon Wind Whistler, a pony who appeared in the MLP and Friends show, as transgender. This is because of her deeper voice compared to the rest of the ponies at Paradise Estate and her color scheme. The light blue and pink appear on the transgender pride flag. Everything is fine.jpg the name of this entry refers to a screen cap from the Magic Coins, where Wind Whistler and Megan stand in the middle of a fire. It sometimes shows up as a meme and kind of looks like the famous This Is Fine comic by Casey Green. Sweet Talkin' Ponies The Sweet Talkin' Ponies were released in Year 10. These two ponies, Chatterbox and Talks A Lot, would play voice clips when you squeeze the area where their cutie mark was. Phrases include, I love you, I'm pretty, or comb my hair. And according to PonylandPress.com, the Mexican version of the Sweet Talkin' Ponies would say, Soy de Mexico. Literally, I'm from Mexico. Comics. Unlike almost every other Hasbro 80s property, My Little Pony never received its own Marvel Comics tie-in. But in the UK, G1 had two comic books, My Little Pony, which featured stories about just the ponies, and My Little Pony and Friends, which included the Moon Dreamers, among others. The comic books were more like magazines, featuring puzzles, activity club pages, and more. My Little Pony ran from 1985 to 1993 and had 223 issues, while My Little Pony and Friends ran from 1987 to 1994 and had 51 issues. Ember. Ember is the name of a pony who made history twice as being the first baby pony ever produced and the first mail order pony ever produced. Ember came in three colors, white, blue, and purple. The purple variant appeared in Rescue at Midnight Castle, 
and looks different from the baby ponies in the show, being a lot taller and skinnier than the others. Big Brother Ponies The Big Brother Ponies were introduced in year 5 of the toy line, and appear in the story Somnambula. All their cutie marks are themed around traditionally boyish interests, like sports and vehicles like boats and trains. The in-universe reason that the Big Brother Ponies don't appear in the show is that they've been having a year-long race across the entire world, and only return for their debut episode. That means the Somnambula arc would have to be one of the last episodes in the show chronologically. Twice as Fancy Ponies The Twice as Fancy Ponies have markings all over their bodies and not just their flanks. This is something they do in future generations as well as in later years of G1 just with different names. You have Sunshine Ponies, Rockin' Beat Ponies, some of the Pony Families, Flower Fantasy Ponies, Year 10 had the Color Swirl Ponies which look like Philly Swirl Popsicles. Released in the same year for the 10th anniversary of My Little Pony, there was the Birthday Pony decorated with this confetti type design. My Pretty Pony this was mentioned in the original MLP Iceberg, but My Pretty Pony is a toy Hasbro put out in 1981, and is the precursor to My Little Pony. Unlike the small, soft, colorful ponies that would come later, this pony was 10 inches tall and made of hard plastic. It could blink its eyes, wiggle its ears, and wiggle its tail. It's said that when the marketing director at Hasbro brought one of these home, his wife saw it and suggested that they should make it soft and cuddly, which led to the later pony designs. My Pretty Pony came in a few variants. One came with the pony Butterscotch and was called My Pretty Pony and Beautiful Baby, and one that resembles Peachy with a pink coat and hearts for a symbol. Clipper Clipper is a male baby pony who is available through mail order. It's possible that he could be the first mail order pony in the toy line, though there could be some other secret boy pony to steal his spot that you can shout out in the comments. Mail Order Ponies Mail order ponies were something that happened from G1 to G3, wherein you'd send in proofs of purchase and money for shipping in exchange for an exclusive pony that could only be delivered through the mail. Due to their limited availability, mail order ponies are pretty rare. The elusive Rapunzel pony is the rarest of all. Based on the fairy tale, Rapunzel has longer hair than most ponies, with a few bits of tinsel woven in. From what information is available online, she can go for around $800 or more. Other mail order exclusives include the Twice as Fancy Baby Ponies, the Birth Flower Ponies, the previously mentioned Baby Ember and Clipper, and Little Tot. The last one is notable because for every person that ordered a Little Tot pony through the mail, one would be donated through the Toys for Tots charity organization. Princess Dragons Spike isn't the only dragon character from Generation 1. The Year 5 Princess Ponies would come with these dragons, who all reuse the same mold from Spike, just with different colors. There's Fiery, Flash, Spiny, Sparks, Smokey, and Prickles. These dragons never showed up in the My Little Pony TV show, but did in some promotional material. Customs Custom My Little Pony figures have been a thing for a while. With the endless possibilities of symbol designs, and with custom ponies being relatively easy to make, no clothes or additional molding involved for most of them, it's no wonder why custom ponies have become such a big part of the collecting community. Level 3 Katrina Drug Allegory If you know anything about cartoons in the 80s, you know that they loved their anti-drug PSAs. Gem and the Holograms, another Hasbro show, had one. Of course, you can't forget Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, basically Avengers Endgame but replaced Thanos with weed. Brave Star and Captain Planet were even willing to kill kids on screen to get the point across. My Little Pony is way more subtle with their message, but it's definitely still there. The special Escape from Katrina features the title character overcoming her addiction to these potions that give her magic powers. They show how she'll go to any length to make them, enslaving the bushwoolies and ponies. How she used to be beautiful, how it ruined her life. The special has a sweet ending where she and her boyfriend, minion, bestie, get to relive the good old days. It's a very human depiction of this kind of thing, especially for an 80s cartoon. It's better than Brave Star, where smoking apparently turns you into like a weird rage zombie. Also, does anybody want a Brave Star iceberg? Sound off in the comments if you do. Pony Friends. Pony Friends were a series of non-pony characters released by Hasbro in years 5 through 7. Some are normal animals you'd expect, like giraffe, camel, zebra, lamb, and then you've got Cutie Saurus. 
According to this My Little Pony catalog from the time, there were supposed to be human characters released alongside the Pony Friends. The human Pony Friends wouldn't be released, however, and only exist as prototypes. Cha Cha the Llama was a Pony Friend who returned in blind bags for G4.5. Speaking of G4.5, that generation introduced the Wildsiders, who didn't get any merchandise, but are still the same concept. And of course, you can't overlook the non-Pony characters in Generation 4 who'd have toys made of them, like Zakora the Zebra. Giant Plush Sundance Giant, one-of-a-kind, life-size plushes of Sundance and Baby Sundance were created as a promotional thing, and were featured in this My Little Pony magazine, along with live-action Megan and Molly. To my knowledge, the Baby Sundance plush has never been found, but Adult Sundance was found at a yard sale in Quebec. She was beaten up in an awful condition but was restored by her current owner. Winking Out Winking Out is the term used for when a unicorn teleports or turns invisible. The phrase was first used in the Return of Tambalon arc. In real life, the term winking out means to come to an end, according to Merriam-Webster. That definition is fitting, seeing as how when the unicorns in the story wink out, they get teleported to the bad guy's dungeon. International Nirvana Ponies Nirvana, in the My Little Pony collecting sphere, is a term used to describe rare ponies that were produced overseas. A step above most European exclusives in rarity, a lot of Nirvana ponies are highly sought after by collectors. A portion of Nirvanas, like the ones from South Africa, Peru, or Italy, for example, have different colorings from the American ones, like this yellow minty. Others are completely new, like the birth flower ponies that were sold in Australia, there are also some Brazilian ponies that don't even have a symbol on their flank. Brazil also had these little felt ponies called Os Fofinhos. Spain had these ponies with original molds called Piggy Ponies. The pose is based on the Spanish trot, a trained movement performed by a horse wherein they put their forward leg diagonally up like this. Some piggies were based on existing ponies while some were original creations. Also, just clarifying, piggies might not be considered Nirvana ponies, since they're not under that section of the wiki. Just putting that out there before anybody comes around in the comments and blah blah blah. And of course, who could forget about the Venezuelan squeaky butt ponies from 1985? Blank Prototypes Over the years, a few G1 prototypes have leaked. Most interestingly, these blank ones with no hair. I assume these were made to test out the molds. Early prototypes of the original six ponies show different symbols, which look like the spots on the Appaloosa breed of horse. Other prototypes even have different colors or poses compared to their final designs. These slightly different prototypes are mostly seen in catalogs or other promotional material. Fairy Tales Fairy Tales, as in tales like on an animal, was a sister line to My Little Pony that was in stores from 1986 to 1987. Instead of colorful ponies with symbols, brushable hair and tails, they were colorful birds with symbols, brushable hair and tails. Though fairy tales never got a cartoon, just like MLP, they had a few gimmicks, like fairy tales with fuzzy tummies, ones with tropical colors, babies, and ones with paper fans for tails. The characters did appear in the My Little Pony and Friends UK comic book. Bootlegs slash Fakies my Little Pony bootlegs are really something that deserve their own video. From Remco's Pretty Pets, to Princess Rinse and Spit, to the company Simba, which would literally just use the exact molds as the Hasbro ponies. G1 or G3 style fakies are actually the most common from what I've seen in the wild. I've seen only a few G4 bootlegs, whereas G1 fakies I've seen as prizes in arcades at Dollar Tree, Ocean State Job Lot, Rennies. I remember even seeing a set at a Burlington once. Alternate Theme Songs so, this refers to multiple things. The My Little Pony G1 melody has a few variations on the lyrics. The one we associate with G1 only plays at the beginning of Rescue at Midnight Castle. Escape from Katrina and the 86 movie have their own variations, and there's even another one used for the MLP sections of My Little Pony and Friends. The entire block had its own theme song, with a sequence that would splice together clips from My Little Pony and whatever other show it was airing with, and also appeared to have some original animation at the end. There was also a different theme song used in the commercials. Earlier ones used the classic theme, while others had this one that encouraged playing with the ponies like a baby doll. I'm a My Little Pony Mommy. Seven Songs and a Story Seven Songs and a Story is a My Little Pony record produced by Bullseye Music and released by Hasbro in 1985. It was available through mail order in the UK, and featured songs based on Applejack, Bowtie, Lickety Split, Posey, Cherry's Jubilee, and Tootsie. You can listen to the whole thing on YouTube, as well as find a few PMVs with Applejack's song. Photo Needed Placeholder.jpg This refers to a photo used on My Little Wiki. It's used as a placeholder when a picture isn't available for a pony, other piece of merchandise, or whatever. Most articles have a picture showing the pony it's referring to, 
but if there isn't one to be found, you get stuck with this black and white picture of G4 Applejack. My little wiki has a page called Wanted, where they list things that need to be filled out, so if you can, I really recommend you help them out. They've been a great resource for so many of my videos, and I can't thank them enough. Also, they're one of the only wikis that isn't stuck with the awful fandom wiki layout, which is impossible to navigate, <laughs> or at least impossible to navigate without having like a headache. Sweet Steps Ballerina Ponies The Sweet Steps Ballerina Ponies were released in Year 9. Unlike most ponies, they have one point of articulation in their limbs. These are the only ponies from G1 that have this. This was used to market them as you can move the ponies' limbs and imagine that they're dancing. There was also a set of baby ballerina ponies that came out the following year, which is just the same idea but with baby pony molds. Since all of these ballerina ponies wear these little suits, the symbol is on the top of their flank and not on the side. First Marvel Movie <clears throat> My Little Pony the Movie is actually one of, if not the first movie that Marvel the company ever produced. During the 80s, Marvel Productions worked with Hasbro and another company, Sunbow Entertainment, to bring properties like G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Gem and the Holograms to TVs, and sometimes the big screen. The first theatrical production that's listed under Marvel Productions is 1986's My Little Pony the Movie. And yes, I checked, this is THE Marvel. And I also just want to clear it up, this isn't the first piece of non-comic media they've ever produced, or the first movie based on their comics, or anything like that. It's just the first movie that a production company related to Marvel, the comics company, produced. This Marvel Productions isn't the Marvel that brought us the MCU, though. Due to a bunch of complicated corporate nonsense, the Marvel Studios that exists now is an entirely separate company from this, but also isn't. Because it used to be owned by Fox, and then Fox got bought by Disney, so now Disney owns most of its stuff. Even though by the time the 80s Marvel production stuff, which in 1993 had been renamed New World Pictures, got absorbed into Disney, Disney owned the actual Marvel. And then there's Saban Entertainment, they've got something to do with it probably. Anyway, Hasbro bought the rights to all of Marvel and Sunbow's productions based on their properties. So, there's nothing to worry about, hopefully. 80s Plush Ponies Official plush ponies began to be sold in 1985, and went on for a few years. The plush line included Earth Ponies, Unicorns, Pegasi, Baby Ponies, and a few Rainbow Ponies. A while later, they put out these plushies that doubled as PJ cases. Something I've never heard of, but I guess you just put your PJs in these. Skydancer Roller Skates there were a few ponies that came with roller skates, but this entry is referring to this set of roller skates from 1986. Of course, they wouldn't fit an adult, but these would be pretty cool to own as a collector's item. Reused Names So, as we all know, pony names can reappear across generations, but G1 went on for so long that a lot of pony names got reused only years later. These are different from being a variant of another pony, since they have entirely separate colors and symbols. Examples include Bright Eyes, the Twinkle-Eyed Pony versus Bright Eyes from My Little Pony Tales, Cha-Cha being both the Sweetheart Sister Pony and a Llama, Pink Dreams being a Flutter Pony and a Soft Sleepy Newborn. There are a lot more I haven't mentioned, so go to the wiki if you want a proper catalog of all these. Pony Hair Properties in The Glass Princess, it's revealed that the pony's hair has magical properties and can grow back instantly. In a few of the back card stories, we see how pony's hair has something special about it, like the curly hair rainbow ponies. Could the hair be the true source of the pony's magic, since it's so close to the unicorn's horn? Could the magic just come in the pony's head and be projected by whatever's on top? So, explaining why the unicorns can do magic the best and have big horns. McDonald's Tie-In in Generation 2, up until now, fast food MLP tie-ins have been actual ponies. Not on the same level of quality as the actual retail toys, but still, a pony usually with a comb. In 1984, McDonald's ran a promotion with My Little Pony bookmarks in Happy Meals. These ran opposite to a set of Transformers toys that didn't transform, so either way, if you're a fan of either going to McDonald's, you probably should have lowered your expectations. Sweetheart Sister Ponies in year 7, Hasbro began releasing these skinnier, teenage-looking ponies under the name Sweetheart Sister Ponies. This type of pony continued into year 10, with a few different names. Prom Queen Sweetheart Sister Ponies, Glittery Sweetheart Sister Ponies, Pretty Ponies, Sweet Kisses Ponies, Sun Dazzle Ponies, all had familiar, if not the same, molds. Horseshoe Points Horseshoe Points are a proof of purchase found on the backs of My Little Pony products in G1. 
You could send these in for exclusive mail order offers, like the ones I mentioned on the last level. Aside from the back of pony packaging, you could also redeem your ticket sub from the My Little Pony movie, which was worth 5 horseshoe points. In Greece, they had pony coins, which had the same purpose and a higher exchange rate from horseshoe points to pony coins. Horseshoe points also appeared in Generation 2 and 3, with Generation 3's proofs of purchase called Pony Points. Firefly's Adventure Firefly's Adventure was a Year 9 VHS release of Rescue at Midnight Castle that was bundled with Firefly. The back card for the bundle spells Tirak's name as Tiarak, like Tear or Tear. This magazine ad also shows what appear to be screenshots from Escape from Katrina, but redrawn for some reason. Dance and Prance Ponies Dance and Prance Ponies were from Year 7. The gimmick with them was that you'd turn this little wind-up mechanism in the front, and their tail would spin around, making it look like they were dancing. Based on magazine scans, they originally had different poses for each pony, but the final products all shared the same pose. It's theorized that the reason they're all molded the same is to make sure the spinning tail mechanism works consistently. Activity Club Baby Pony The My Little Pony Activity Club was a fan club in the UK that people could subscribe to for newsletters and small gifts, like membership badges, calendars, drawstring bags, colored pencils, etc. In later years, exclusive baby ponies were shipped out to club members. The 1989 Activity Club Baby lacked a name or symbol, and members were encouraged to name it themselves. There were also two other baby ponies distributed through the Activity Club, with actual symbols and proper names. G4 Manga Crossover In Volume 3 of the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic manga, Twilight Sparkle accidentally teleports herself to the G1 universe, replacing her with G1 Twilight. While she's there, she knocks a pony in the head and prevents Megan from ever getting to Ponyland, but manages to save the day and defeat T-Rack, whose name is spelled like the G4 character. Porcina and Mighty Magiswords Princess Porcina is the main antagonist of the Glass Princess arc, an anthropomorphic pig with a crown. In the 2015 Cartoon Network show Mighty Magiswords, there's a character named Queen Porcina, who looks incredibly similar. This was thought to be a reference or a cameo originally, but Kyle A. Carosa, the creator of Mighty Magiswords said that it was a coincidence. Porcina literally means pork or swine in Latin or Spanish, so the name is easy to brush aside, but the designs do really look similar. Oh my gosh, you made it halfway through the video! Uh, well, halfway through the script. Thank you for coming this far, and don't forget to add me on all my stuff, and subscribe, and like, and all that good stuff. Uh, next few levels are going to get a little more obscure, but there's nothing too crazy. I tried to steer away from the evil, uh, mentions. Level 4, Dressed Like a Dream Subtitles. If you look up the song Dressed Like a Dream from the Escape from Katrina special and turn on the subtitles, you'll be greeted with some questionable lyrics. And this is beyond the average YouTube subtitles mishearing things. The problem is when you look up the video now, the uploader turned off the subtitles. As I was writing this, I was gonna give a transcript, but I can't. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. If anyone else knows what I'm talking about, you can give some sort of transcript in the comments. But what I can remember, there was the phrase pressed diamond tree, which is actually pretty standard. But then there was a transvestite for some reason, and a lot more stuff like that. Animation errors. There are a ton of animation errors in G1. On the wiki, there's an entire catalog of them for each story. If you're familiar with 80s cartoons, you know the typical stuff. Characters' voices coming out of the wrong mouth, drawn with different colors, etc. One from Rescue at Midnight Castle gives the Moochick character human ears. Apparently, the elf ears on his hat were just a fake. HQG1C. HQG1C is a fan-made project by the MLP Collector community to make brand new custom-style ponies. The first pony made for the project was Genie, 
who symbolized the wishes do come true theme of the project, of making people's dream ponies. Some of my favorites are Batty Boo, Little Pumpkin, Star Spangled, and the Artistry Girls. The customs are made using eco-friendly plastic, with the mane, tail, and symbols all being done by hand. They can be found on sites like Etsy and theponybusiness.com if anyone's interested. My Little Pony Fan Club In year two, Hasbro started the My Little Pony Fan Club in the US. This is similar to the UK's Activity Club. Upon joining, you'd be sent a Blue Ribbon Award and membership card, an official My Little Pony Sew On emblem, a My Little Pony paper doll, a powder puff scented necklace, and a full color poster. Joining the fan club would also come with a subscription to the My Little Pony Hoofbeat newsletter, which doesn't seem to be all that well documented. Mail and forms for the fan club say the newsletter is filled with stories, games, pictures, and loads of activities. In year 5, the club was discontinued and replaced with a new one, though that seems to not exist or not even be that well documented either. Regrind Regrind is a condition that happens over time, where pink or sometimes yellow spots appear on a pony. There's no definitive cause for this, but people have speculated that A. It's because of some ponies being made with unused recycled plastic from the factory, B. A manufacturing error with the dyed plastic that's used to make the pony's bodies, where bits of raw dye somehow leach outward creating the color splotches. The second cause seems more likely, because only certain ponies seem to be infected with regrind. Mostly pink, orange, or purple ones. Dolly Mix Dolly Mix is a candy from the UK that has tiny multicolored shapes with slight flavorings. In 2009 and 2010, bags of the candy would come with a random pony. The 2010 bags were based on G1 ponies like Applejack, Gusty, and Firefly, but had molds that were based on G3, and had G3-styled artwork on the packaging. It's kind of interesting because a few of these characters, like Applejack, would be remade for G3, but with different colors and symbols. Having the original designs in the G3 style, even if it's just a little tiny figure, is pretty cool. Sippin' Soda Ponies The Sippin' Soda Ponies were released in year 10, the gimmick with these is that they would be able to quote unquote drink from this plastic ice cream soda that they came with. Ponyland Press says that each sip and soda pony came with a large scented plastic ice cream soda with a hard clear plastic straw made to fit into a hole in the pony's mouth. When the pony is squeezed, a row of colored balls travels up and down inside the straw, creating the illusion that the pony is drinking the ice cream. As well as the ice cream, the pony would be scented too. It's an interesting gimmick, although with some imagination, the straw and the ice cream soda looks like something else. This is definitely not Crack Pipe Pony. First Tooth Baby Ponies The First Tooth Baby Ponies are one of the weirdest gimmicks from G1. In year 5, Hasbro made these ponies with one big snaggle tooth hanging out of their mouths. They even make appearances in the cartoon, where they serve the same narrative function as the Cutie Mark Crusaders from Generation 4 being the younger counterparts to the older ponies, who always seem to get themselves into some sort of trouble. Newborn Twins Newborn Twin Ponies appeared in a lot of the same episodes as the first two baby ponies in the cartoon, and these were even smaller than the regular baby ponies. These would obviously come packaged together because of the twin name, but unlike a lot of other releases, they'd come in a box with a ton of accessories. There were also the Teeny Tiny Baby Ponies from Year 9, with Teeny Tiny Twin Ponies in Year 10. Believe it or not, these are not the same molds. The teeny tiny ponies have smaller muzzles than the newborn twins. France exists in Ponyland. In the epic saga of The Prince and the Ponies, the ponies get taken to a place in Ponyland that is very clearly 18th or 19th century France. But it's in Ponyland. So does that mean they actually just went to France, and in this world, France hasn't progressed in terms of culture or technology past the 1800s? Or maybe Ponyland is actually the distant past, and Megan is traveling back in time every time she goes to Ponyland. We do see a lot of other medieval castles and the like, but there are things that even disprove that, like Nightshade being an 80s style pop star. Merry-Go-Round Game The My Little Pony Merry-Go-Round Game was put out by Milton Bradley, at the time a subsidiary of Hasbro, and they still are. The goal of the game is to stamp this card with all four pony stamps twice. Players have four cards, one for each pony, and at the start of every turn, each player places one of the cards face down, the merry-go-round gets spun. If the color on the merry-go-round matches the color on a player's face down card, the player gets to use the stamp to fill out their score sheet. Happy Tails Ponies The Happy Tails Ponies were from year 6. By squeezing their body, the ponies were able to twirl their tails around. Sort of a combination of the Dance and Prance Ponies and the Venezuelan Squeaky Ponies. OG6 Narcolepsy 
This refers to how the first six ponies, called the Collector Series, would always fall over. This was apparently because of their heads being too heavy. To fix this, metal weights would be added to the opposite area of the pony's body to balance it out. My Little Pony The Retro Show My Little Pony The Retro Show was a series of shorts on the official My Little Pony YouTube channel. Out of the five videos in the series, three of them are hidden on the channel. One of these is a G4 parody of the Beverly Hills 90210 intro. Nothing too special. The other one shows a clip from the end of Flutter Valley with jokey captions being shown on screen. The music festival was the first of its kind and went on to, to inspire others such as Burning Man, Woodstock Coachella, Lollapalooza, and Fire Festival. Spike and Megan briefly dated it during season one. Sprinkle Bottom's clown career was sadly cut short after her unfortunate knife throwing accident. The season abruptly ended when Megan's head was bit off by an alligator thingy. It's not laugh out loud funny, but it's acceptable for a YouTube thing. It's on the same level as, like, Nostalgia Critic or Cinema Sins mixed with those old glam segments from Disney Channel, if anyone remembers those. And apparently there was, or people tried to cause, controversy over this video, saying how it was mocking the old generation and pandering to young fans. Well, nobody remembers this, so I guess the quote-unquote pandering wasn't all that profitable for Hasbro. Real Color Prototypes When asked to retool the design for My Pretty Pony, Designer Bonnie Zachary made prototypes with realistic colors, like brown, gray, and beige. Although, these were what Zachary preferred as a longtime lover of horses, the more colorful ponies that people suggested tested better with the target demographic. Nightmare Fuel Episodes You'd figure a show about cute ponies would be nice, cute, innocent, delicious, scrumptious, right? Well, you're dead bloody wrong, mate. The villains in this show have several unpleasant aspects in store for both the viewers, the token humans, and the ponies. Look here. Tirak and Katrina are absolutely demented, nightmare fuel, and are part of the show as the pilot or uh, independent episodes within the series. Princess Porcina turning Ponyland and its inhabitants into glass with her magic cloak. She's not even aware of what she's done at first, saying that when she looked through the mirror, the ponies didn't seem real. Somnambula is a witch who lets every pony live their dream with everything they ever wanted, even as she saps their energy, accelerating their aging so fast that in the matter of hours, they're really long in the tooth. It's a near villain victory too. All the adults would have died had not the bird taken a chance to flee and then break the hypnosis, and had not Slugger seen his beloved in this state and gotten his heroic second wind. The unicorn she changed to her crystal, the close-up of them shows they are aware, they are sentient, they are awake, with Button staring right at Slugger, clearly not happy about her condition. Somnambula had chained them up like that, sucking the life and magic out of them for the entire day, intending to keep them that way forever. The quest of Princess Ponies has Lavin, a lava demon who turns himself into a crystal being with the Princess Ponies' wands and unbalances the magic of Ponyland. When he's defeated, he explodes. The truly terrifying thing here is that Lavin says he hadn't gained full control over his power yet when he was destroyed. Just what Lavin had been capable of if he had time to do that? We have no bloody idea, we haven't seen him since, he went off to Columbia and never came back. Lavin abusing his minions is also rather frightening, especially when he throws Sludge across the room into a wall and the impact is far from pleasant. Or Sludge's scream when Lavin blasts him in the face. The dual desert turns anything it touches to crystal, while Lavin's meddling sends it out of control, including living things. One of the poor bushwoolies finds this out the hard way, and then Wind Whistler is pinned under a crystallized branch while one of her friends desperately tries to save her, both acknowledging there's no way help will come in time to prevent the desert from getting her. Six Week Production My Little Pony the movie only took six weeks to animate, resulting in animation not on par with other animated theatrical films at the time, or even the other specials. The movie was a historic bomb and was panned by critics. Maybe if Hasbro had given Toei more time, the movie's animation would have been a saving grace for its reception. Charmkins Charmkins was a Hasbro line from the early 80s. The figures could be played with and worn as jewelry. At the time, Hasbro didn't have any popular toys in the girls' aisle, and they hoped Charmkins would fill that role. Despite the interesting gimmick, 
Charmkin's lost out to My Little Pony in terms of popularity. One of the Charmkin animals, called My Pixie Pony, looks suspiciously similar to a pony of the My Little variety. The mold for My Pixie Pony wouldn't go to waste. Hasbro used it a few other times for official My Little Pony products. The My Little Pony fan club necklace, McDonald's bookmarks, and the charms that would come bundled with select ponies in 1989. Sets like the Family Ponies and Magic Message Ponies, you'd have to rub on the symbol to reveal a special message, came with the charms. Even one of the mail order ponies was packaged with one. In Greece, more ponies with this unicorn mold were released under the Charmkin's name, this time being molded with colorful plastic with no paint. Some translucent, others not. Keeper's Plagiarism Keepers was a line by Tonka that ran from 1985 to 1992. The whole gimmick came in these keys that you would use to open up the characters and find little babies or other things inside. In 1990, Hasbro made the secret surprise ponies, who had a similar gimmick. Whether this was an answer to Tonka's line or not, it doesn't matter anymore. In 1991, Tonka was bought by Hasbro, absorbing all their competing IPs, including Keepers, which was in competition with My Little Pony, and the GoBots, which was in competition with the Transformers. So, we could potentially see a crossover for both of those. Um, just saying, Hasbro, IDW. My Little Kitty, Puppy, Bunny. Hasbro tried to branch out with other My Little lines in 1989 that focused on different animals. There were three of these. My Little Kitty, My Little Bunny, and My Little Puppy. All animals that could be deemed cute enough by the target audience to buy as a toy. The kitties came in tabby- Oh my god, my cat's on my desk. Are you done? The kitties came in Tabby, Siamese, Angora, Calico, and Persian, with a few accessories bundled with each figure. The dogs came in Spaniel, Poodle, Labrador, and Dalmatian, and were pretty much the same idea as the cats. Rabbits came in Angora, Floppy, Cottontail, and Hopper, vaguely based on real breeds of bunny. For all three of these, adults would come bundled in with a few babies most of the time. Sets would also include accessories, like the ones that came with ponies. Every puppy slash kitty slash bunny card had a My Little Pony here at the bottom to give some brand recognition. None of these had individual back cards the way ponies did. Every one of these had the same story, telling how the other animals came down from the almighty rainbow to play with the ponies. Copyright sold for $1. When Bonnie Zachary finalized the idea of what would become My Little Pony, Hasbro had to give her some sort of money for the copyright, separate from her salary at the company. I don't know anything about like legal stuff or copyright, so don't take my word for that. Uh, as a result, Hasbro paid Zachary one USD for the rights to My Little Pony. At the time, nobody knew what it was going to become, so there wasn't really any incentive to strike up a deal or negotiate for royalties or anything like that. By the time My Little Pony took off, Bonnie Zachary was working at Parker Brothers, designing what was to be their biggest new line, Nerfles. My Pretty Mermaids. My Pretty Mermaids was yet another spin-off of My Little Pony that featured a different type of creature. These came out alongside year 10 of MLP. The mermaids were these little dolls with brushable hair and mermaid tails. Like every other My Little Pony spin-off from this time, they had gimmicks like rainbow hair, princess mermaids, etc. There were also variants of the main four mermaids with a darker skin tone. Pictures of these are uncommon but can be found with a little bit of searching. In terms of the lore, the mermaids aren't connected to the ponies, but their branding shows that they're part of the same family. Early magazines showed them bundled with My Little Pony combs, and commercials featured the familiar My Little Pony tune. Year 10 also had baby mermaid ponies, so I guess Hasbro was just on a mermaid binge that year for some reason. I wonder if there might have been anything to happen in the early 90s, or even just before, that would ignite the public interest in mermaids, like make people want to buy mermaid toys. Maybe some super popular movie that may or may not have started some sort of Disney renaissance of some kind perhaps, I don't know. I don't know you guys. Betty by Eye Ponies Betty by Eye Ponies came out in year 3 and 4. The gimmick with these is that they'd close their eyes when laid on their side, Though, the mechanism used for this creates an uncanny look in the ponies' faces. The next year, Hasbro came out with the soft, sleepy newborn ponies, who have a similar mechanism in their eyes, but don't look as creepy. Probably because they're on a larger scale. Pony Families Although baby ponies have been a thing since very early in My Little Pony's history, Pony Families featuring a mother, father, and baby pony came out in year 8. There are three main sets released in the US, the Apple Delight, Sweet Celebrations, and Bright Bouquet families, there are a few others that are exclusive to overseas, 
and some of the US family sets have more or less ponies in different areas. For example, the US Apple Delight family has a mother, father, and daughter, while the UK release has a mother, father, daughter, and son. Petite Ponies Petite ponies were released in years 8 and 9 and were these tiny ponies that came in packs. Petites didn't have any names, so they're mostly identified by their color and symbol. Ponies were designed in such a way that they wouldn't fall over, with stands molded to their hooves. Playsets in their scale were released, like a cottage and palace. They even had a few gimmicks, like pearlized plastic, translucent plastic, and brushable tails. Lightsaber Sound Effect during the scene where Mimic gets her horseshoes back in the Golden Horseshoes, the lightsaber drawing sound effect from Star Wars plays. There's no behind the scenes reason for this, maybe they just bought the sound off of Lucasfilm, or it was free to use and they needed a generic magic flash sound. The sound effect can also be heard during scene transitions in Brave Star, so maybe it was just a sound effect that anyone could pull and use. Porcelain Pony Figures A set of porcelain pony figures were manufactured by the company Extra Special and were released sometime during Generation 1. The collection includes single ponies, as well as a few scenes. The European versions of these figures are less detailed but with more defined color. They also have this little rainbow symbol on the bottom. Whenever I go to any kind of thrift store, I always make sure to look in the little knick-knack section to see if they have these. Uh, they never do. White Windy Windy is a unicorn rainbow pony with an off-white purple color. It's rumored that a white version of her exists, but it's most likely that the color on this particular figure faded to look white after a long time. It could also be the lighting making it look this way. The White Windy has a hoof stamp that indicates it being from Hong Kong, so there is a possibility it is the real deal. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Man-Made Smooths In an article from OverthinkingIt.com, author Peter Fensel mentions several real-world hypothetical scenarios that are similar to the Smooths from the My Little Pony movie. In the movie, the Smooths is a purple blob that consumes all of Ponyland, similar to ideas like the Grey Goo, the Von Neumann machine, and the Stable Strangelet. Grey Goo is a hypothetical nanotechnology that can self-replicate using common materials like water or carbon. By being able to absorb everything around it and reproducing, this nanotechnology is able to swallow everything on Earth. A Von Neumann machine is the same thing, just not related to nanotechnology. More of a general concept of a machine that replicates using common materials. A stable strangelet is the most interesting. This hypothetical scenario involves a stable form of what's called strange matter, which has the potential to turn everything around it into strange matter. It's only a small section of the article that mentions this, but I'm still gonna link to it in the description because it's a fun read and he explains it way better than I do. Transformers and G.I. Joe cameo. When punching up the script, writer Buzz Dixon pitched a scene where the ponies went and asked characters from other Hasbro shows for help. Funny story about an early draft of the My Little Pony movie. I was asked to punch up the original treatment. Basically, this consisted of indicating where various music scenes could go, adding more magic and G.U.S. to otherwise pedestrian talking head scenes, etc. At one point, one of the little ponies had to go looking for something or someone, I forget. I suggested she encounter some of the Transformers and Joes in her search. Specifically, a scene where she flies up to Shipwreck who is drinking some amber fluid from a bottle. Shipwreck would just stare at her in bug-eyed disbelief and she'd fly on. Then Shipwreck would smash the bottle, take his cap off his head, put his left hand over his heart and raise his right hand in an oath muttering frantically under his breath. Hasbro said, very funny. No. One of the scenes had the ponies coming across shipwreck from G.I. Joe. As funny as it was to the writers, Hasbro rejected the idea for this scene. There was also a planned cameo by Optimus Prime from the Transformers. That idea was rejected too. But Optimus Prime's voice actor would later guest star in the My Little Pony and Friends TV series as Captain Crab Nasty. Butch Hartman's First Job my Little Pony and Friends featured some notable talent, from Nancy Cartwright, who I mentioned previously, to Gary Conway, creator of The Punisher, to writers like Michael Reeves, who later worked on Batman the Animated Series, and Linda Wolverton, who would later write the screenplays for Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King. Hobby Kids Adventures creator Butch Hartman also worked on the show, after a screening of his senior thesis film, producers at Marvel Productions approached Butch and offered him a job. He'd be hired as a character designer on My Little Pony, where he'd do turnarounds for, quote, a little wizard guy. 
it's very unlikely that this could be the Moochick. Maybe it's this guy from Would Be Dragon Slayer, or most likely of all, the character went through multiple designs and Butch's version never made it into the show. Anyways, he was fired after being sent to the storyboard department to help out and not being able to get good drawings done in time. Based on his account, Hasbro mandated that all the ponies should be in the shot when possible. So for most of the storyboard panels, he was drawing upwards of five characters in a style he wasn't familiar with. With the amount of ponies he had to draw, the sloppy drawings he turned in at the end of those three weeks led him to get fired from Marvel Productions. Anyways, to paraphrase Butch himself, if you're working in the animation industry, make sure you're good at more than one thing. Either that, or if you're a production manager or something like that, don't send your character designer to the storyboard department without checking if he's Butch Hartman or not. Unreleased Baby Truly The Betty by I Pony set was originally going to include a version of Baby Truly, as shown in this magazine scan. She was never released, and only exists as a prototype. Similarly, a first tooth version of Baby Sundance appears in one of the commercials, yet again, she was never released in that form. She only exists as a prototype. My Little Pony Clay Factory The My Little Pony Clay Factory was a kit made by Roseart, yes, that Roseart, in 1984, that allowed you to make your own pony figures using air-dry clay. The set came with some paints and stickers for the pony's eyes and symbols. Cabbage Patch Kid Ponies in 1989, Hasbro bought Coleco, the manufacturer of the Cabbage Patch Kids. In the early 90s, they expanded the Cabbage Patch line with these crimp and curl ponies that had stylable hair and tails, and were big enough for the Cabbage Patch Kids to ride. In 1993, crimp and curl ponies were given their own separate line from the Cabbage Patch Kids branding, called Magic Meadow Ponies. In the beginning, six of them were released, first as Earth Ponies, then with some being Unicorns or Pegasi. All of them have basic names like Beauty, Princess, and Sundance? Like the My Little Pony pony. The line continued for a bit with some gimmicks like Sparkly Ponies and the like, before it fizzled out with the Secret Surprise Twin Ponies around the mid-90s. Rika and Draggle's Father Who had relations with Hidia the Witch and bore her two children? Was it T-Rack? Maybe some other magic user like Beezin or, again, the wizard from Would-Be Dragon Slayer, who looks like Jasper from The Simpsons? Maybe it was a regular person. And that question is never brought up or answered in either the movie, show, or My Little Pony Generations, which features Hideous granddaughters. Brush and Grow Ponies In year 6, Hasbro put out the Brush and Grow Ponies. The gimmick with these is that you would be able to pull their tail out while you brushed it, giving the illusion that the pony's tail would grow. You could retract the tail by turning the pony's head to the side. A year later, there were the Princess Brush and Grow Ponies, which were the same idea, just mixed with the idea of the Princess Ponies from Year 5. Little Pretty During the 80s, a few other companies tried to compete for My Little Pony's throne in the girls' aisle, including the aforementioned Keepers, Kenner's Philly Fashion Stars, and Mattel's Little Pretty. This was a line of My Little Pony-like kitties and puppies that ran from 1990 to 1991. And when I say My Little Pony-like, I mean it. They came with symbols and all. They had their own proof of purchase called Paw Points. They had baby kitties and puppies. They had gimmicks like hair that would grow and scented plastic. There were even plans to expand the line into fillies, as well as plushies and Christmas-themed pets. But all of those never saw the light of day. One more thing to note about Little Pretty is some of the names, like Pika Blue, Flutterina, Perfuma, Frosta, Catra, there's even one named Bo. Remind you of anything else? Any other Mattel thing, perhaps? Catra and Frosta dolls each sold separately. Shira doll also sold separately. New from Mattel. Yeah, you know what I mean. They're all named after Brave Star characters. Sweet Ice Delight Cottage There are two genders. You're either Snoopy Snow Cone Maker or Spongebob Snow Cone Maker. But what if I told you? There was almost an official My Little Pony Snow Cone Maker that doubled as a playset. The My Little Pony Sweet Ice Delight Cottage was just that. The cottage came with a small bottle for the snow cone flavoring shaped like a pony, with a cap that made it look like she was wearing a Devo hat. There were also a few accessories that came bundled with the cottage for you to use with your other ponies. I'm pretty sure most people know how these work. You put the ice in the top of the windmill, turn the crank, 
Then it shaves it and deposits it into this cute little cup that sits on the balcony. I'd also assume the windmill turns when you turn the crank, but we've never seen a video of this, so it's hard to say for sure. Mix the Kool-Aid that came with the set, pour it on the ice, eat it with this fancy spoon, and then play with your pony if you want. It's unclear why this never got released, maybe it was too ambitious or expensive to manufacture, or because of safety concerns with the kids putting their hands into the windmill and cutting themselves. A version of the classic Snoopy snow cone maker got recalled in 2013 because of a part that could fall out and, if it got into a snow cone, could hurt somebody's mouth. That might have been a concern also. That's unrelated to the My Little Pony thing, but it might have been a concern also. Fans of both My Little Pony and Novelty Snow Cone Makers finally got their dream around 2005 in My Little Pony Generation 3 when we got the Snow Cone Maker featuring a molded, foreshortened Pinkie Pie. Hasbro actually used this mold for the mountain at least twice, once for their redesigned Snoopy Snow Cone Maker from 2004 and again for the My Little Pony one. Wow, so many connections today. 3 Hours of Pure Pony Pleasure Three Hours of Pure Pony Pleasure is a slogan from a My Little Pony compilation tape from UK distributor Tempo Video. They had the series called The Biggest X Video Ever. These were of course based on their length, with slogans like Three Hours of Mega Intergalactic Fun, Three Hours of Fun with Everyone's Favorite Bear. I guess alliteration was only something they went for with My Little Pony. Either way, the phrase placed out of context makes you think of something the opposite of kid-friendly. MLP Killed Gem Gem and the Holograms is another 80s toy franchise by Hasbro, in the vein of My Little Pony and Transformers. In the mid to late 80s, there was consideration for a theatrical gem movie, similar to the My Little Pony and Transformers movies, but because of those other two not doing so well, the gem movie was scrapped. So My Little Pony is technically partially to blame for the downfall of gem, along with the Transformers. Real Horses Anatomically correct, or at least relatively anatomically correct horses, appear in the Bright Lights story. Nightshade has these backup singers called the Shadowettes, who look completely different from any of the ponies. There's also his hometown of Greyvale. The horses there also look more true to life than any of the colorful pastel ponies we see in the rest of the show. We also see a few of Megan's horses in the human world, like TJ from Rescue at Midnight Castle. Pony Makeup Certain ponies, like this one, would come bundled in with little human-sized accessories like a thing of eyeshadow or a bottle of nail polish. But as for actual toy-sized makeup the ponies could wear, that 100% is a thing. That just can't be found on the wiki that easily. There was also bubble bath that could be used with the ponies that came with the waterfall playset in year 2. Based on real Japanese pony Bonnie Zachary spent a part of her childhood living with her father, who was a veterinarian for the US Army stationed in Japan. That's where she developed her love for horses, specifically with meeting this one Korean pack pony. If it weren't for that guy, My Little Pony as we know it probably wouldn't exist. Drinking Wet Ponies Like some of the later commercials would have you believe, I'm a My Little Pony Mama. These ponies were meant to be played with like a baby doll. It's already been mentioned in another layer that ponies go to the bathroom, but it's nice that Hasbro confirmed it to be canon again. Mystery Rainbow Earth Pony There's an Earth Pony with rainbow hair and a rainbow symbol who appears in the Rescue at Midnight Castle special but isn't given a name or any speaking lines. There's no merch of this character either, but there is one of the porcelain pony figures who looks suspiciously similar. There are a few ponies that resemble this one, like some of the twice as fancy rainbow or rainbow curl ponies, but those came way later and after this special was produced. Pony Infrastructure Why do the ponies in the show have a house with running water and electricity? It's been confirmed that the mooch expands it in with magic, but how is it sustained? Why do we almost never see anything like it in the rest of the show? Here's what an anonymous poster on 4chan's MLP board has to say. In the episode, The Ghost of Paradise Estate Part 1, the baby and adult ponies, along with Megan, Danny, and Molly, are seen using paint rollers and paint cans. This can easily be written off as the Williams children bringing them from their home, seeing as they live on a farm and would be used to using tools such as these. However, later on in the episode, an electrical light switch can be seen being used. This would imply that the estate is connected to a main grid, or powered locally from solar or water power. By extent, this would also imply that the ponies have some form of industrialization. 
The question is, how far along is their industrialization and where did it come from? It is easy to say that the Moochik provided the electricity for magic, but this also raises the question of how much he knows. Does he know how to wire a house, or did the magic do it for him? Furthermore, ponies throughout the series can be seen using tools that are clearly not meant to be used by them. Instead of holding objects with handles horizontally, such as paintbrushes, they must hold them vertically to be able to use them. So where do these unaccommodating tools come from? Where does their electricity come from? All other species that have hands are either unfamiliar to the ponies or are not advanced enough to create them. This leaves two vastly different outcomes. The first is other humans. Humans besides the Williams are not new. The witches from the Volcano of Gloom and Scorpan are humans. However, neither are shown to have used or produced the tool seen, nor create or state the knowledge of electricity. This means that, for the ponies to have electricity, humans in the past must have helped the ponies to some extent. But how and what their story is, is unknown. The second outcome is the bees. They are openly shown to have knowledge to make and operate simple machinery, such as a crane. This would also explain why the tools the ponies use are not designed for them. They know nothing different. Possibly long ago, before the bees were forced to leave Flutter Valley, the two had an uneasy alliance, where bits of information were traded, such as tools suited for hands. Perhaps the answer is that long ago, the ponies learned how to make and use tools and machinery from the bees. Many years later, possibly during the late 1700s, early 1800s, as electrical workings would have been much simpler, the ponies may have helped or befriended humans. In exchange, the humans gave po the ponies information on how to produce and use electricity. As the ponies were used to objects made for hands, new designs were not needed, and the ponies learned quickly. If this is the case, then the ponies are the most technologically advanced species in Ponyland, possibly just behind regular humans, as humans in Ponyland seem to still be in a medieval stage. Long story short, ponies using human tools are cute, but weird. Dream Beauties Dream Beauties came out in year 8. These took the My Little Pony formula of colorful coats and symbols on the flank and applied it to real horses. The tagline for these was, they're all grown up My Little Ponies. They had a few variants like the Showtime Beauties, High Flying Beauties, but didn't last for too long. These came out the same year as Kenner's Philly Fashion Stars, so maybe Hasbro was just trying to get a leg up on the competition. Cancelled Rainbow Pony Special this was again mentioned in the first My Little Pony Iceberg, but deserves to be brought up here. Instead of Escape from Katrina being the second My Little Pony special, there was originally a special that featured the Rainbow Ponies. No plot details are known, but there are some VHS covers for Katrina that reveal some stuff. Spike would have been aged up and would have had wings. The Lost Media Wiki says that this character on the cover is Danny, Megan's brother, but he wouldn't make an appearance until the My Little Pony movie in 1986, so this could be an entirely different character. It's unclear why the special was never finished or released, might have been complaints due to the dark tone of Rescue at Midnight Castle that made them change it to something slightly less dark. There are a few seconds of surviving footage online, but in all honesty, it's not a stretch to say that most of this thing is either thrown out or was never completed. Maybe in Hasbro or Marvel's archives, there exists a version of the special, but again, it's highly unlikely. Since the scenes we see from it look like the intro to the first special, maybe the intro and only a few other scenes were completed, but with lost media, you never know. It's always an interesting topic, especially when it's not something that every single person on the planet has mentioned already. Fancy Swirl Ponies in either 2009 or 2010, Hasbro revealed a then unseen piece of concept art showing this group of four ponies with outer space theming. They also had star headbands and these swirl designs on their coats. Fans have given them different names like the fancy swirl ponies, celestial ponies, and fairy brights. Since obviously, no official name for these or any of the individual ponies in the set have been given. People have made customs of these though, trying to recreate the colors and designs of the original concept art that would have been represented as toys. 
And you know, custom makers have to be creative and come up with their own names for each pony. Apparently there's also a campaign to have the Basic Fun Company, the company who manufactures all the G1 throwback figures, to make official versions of these. There's a character called the Great Star Pegasus, who appears in one of the G1 comics. Could this character and the Cosmic Ponies be similar in terms of the lore? There's so little known about these guys. Hurry. Removed Song. A few of the songs from My Little Pony and Friends have been left out of home media releases, including the newer releases on streaming and DVD. Songs from the first two specials like A Little Piece of Rainbow, Go On News, as well as the song Hurry from The Glass Princess Part 4. These weren't cut out due to copyright or anything, just to make room for more commercials when they'd be re-aired, particularly the specials, which were both split up into two parts and re-ran as season finales for the show. I wouldn't call these lost media, since they can be found with a bit of searching, but it's weird that Hasbro didn't think to include them in the current My Little Pony Complete Original Series release. Level 6 Shady says shit. In Mishmash Melee, Gusty, in the body of Shady, says this. Sorry, Fizz, you're on your own! Which, if you squint your ears enough, can be heard as another word. Twinkle-Eyed Pony Backstory Ever wondered why the Twinkle-Eyed Ponies have gems in their eyes? One of the My Little Pony comic books gives us their backstory. The Twinkle-Eyed Ponies were once slaves who were forced to work in a mine by an evil jewel wizard. They were stuck in there so long that their eyes didn't work in daylight anymore. To free the ponies, Applejack rams into the wizard's throne, killing him in the process and causing jewels to fly everywhere. The jewels land in some of the eyes of the other ponies. With them, the ponies are able to see in daylight, but they'll always be a reminder of their cruel subjugation at the hands of the wizard. In metal. Satanic imagery. From evil goats, to demons, to monsters, to black magic, and even light magic, and just magic in general, My Little Pony and Friends can be construed as containing satanic imagery and themes. Obviously, since it's a show with supernatural and magical stuff, creatures and all that, you can draw parallels to most religions. There's that whole Super Mario 64 thing where it's supposedly based on Masonic rituals, and I think if you look hard enough, you can find parallels to that stuff in MLP. I'm no theologist, so don't ask me about any of it. In Somnambula, one of the big brother ponies, Slugger, has a crush on Buttons, a regular pony. Based on the name Big Brother Ponies, you'd assume that them and the little ponies would all be related? I guess not, since these two have a thing going on. Maybe Slugger is actually like a different little pony's big brother? Disney owns the smooths. As we all know, Marvel Productions, which is now owned by Disney, not by them buying Marvel, but by them buying Fox, was one of the companies responsible for My Little Pony, the movie. Hasbro owns the rights to all of Marvel Productions based on their IPs, but certain characters who could and should have appeared in later generations of My Little Pony seem to be changed or even absent. The Smooths does return, but with a completely different design and color. In the comic My Little Pony Generations, Hidia, Rika, and Draggle don't appear. Does Hasbro not own the rights to the non-pony characters from the movie? I remember hearing that one of the reasons a lot of G4 characters are based on G3 characters is because there was some sort of rights issue. For example, they weren't allowed to bring Firefly back and had to make her Rainbow Dash. That one might not be true, but if it is, who would own the rights to these characters? Does Disney own the witches from the Volcano of Gloom? And the Smooths? I doubt that they own any of those G1 ponies, that tidbit is most likely fake. Same with this whole theory, like they probably made the smooth green just so it would stand out when they put it in Canterlot Castle. And the witches in the comics are new characters because this takes place a long time after Generation 1, but still, this is Disney we're talking about. There's a chance they might own everything, or will own in the future any given brand or property. Alpha and the Chipmunks, look out. Ponyland isn't real. So, Megan. When she goes to Ponyland, is she in a coma? Is she hallucinating Ponyland, and her siblings just go along with it? Or the more wholesome idea, these are just stories that she tells Molly and Danny, where all three of them go on fun adventures. 
We see Megan and the others spend a lot of time at this ranch and all seem to like horses, so could that be the reason they show up in this imaginary place that she dreams up, hallucinates, etc? Is Megan dead? Is this purgatory or heaven? Are the ponies real and Megan isn't? Is this what G5 ponies think the events of Equestria Girls were like? We see G1 on the TV screens in G5, remember? It could be some sort of historical fiction. Is Megan telling the stories to her kids, or is it some other person besides her siblings? Is Ponyland a simulation? Is it the past? Is it just a stunt by Banksy? Are they all in the major? Chuck E. Cheese exclusive baby pony in 1989, there was an exclusive baby pony who was only available as a prize at Chuck E. Cheese. It's also referred to as a mail order pony by some, so there's a possibility that it was available through there too. This pony is notable as one of, if not the only, to have a corporate logo for a symbol. Pony Birth Where do baby ponies come from? Like the twinkle-eyed ponies, the comics do have a backstory for them. In this story, Firefly makes a wish that she'd have someone special to look after. Suddenly, a baby version of her jumps out of a nearby mirror. Turns out, this is an enchanted mirror that spawns baby ponies. So in the canon of these comics, this is where baby ponies come from. In the toys, though, we see mothers and fathers, meaning that these ponies reproduce like real horses. There's also... The Surprise Twins Pony. This pony came out in year 12, with a pretty unique feature. There's a little hatch that you pull out with this pink knob, which makes her give birth to these two newborn ponies. In her back card story, she mentions a daddy pony, confirming that in the canon of the toys at least, they don't reproduce asexually. Moondancer x Glory one of the porcelain pony figures has this wedding scene, featuring the ponies Moondancer and Glory. There's no confirmation that they gender swapped either of them, making any of them male, so, you know. Love wins. Vitamine. The Vitamine, from what I understand, is a French programming block that would air cartoons and have segments with the hosts in between. It aired on the channel TF1 and had a lineup of cartoons from different studios, like Deke, Hanna-Barbera, Ruby Spears, Filmation, and even dubs of Japanese shows like Gacha Man and Mickey Momo. The block aired only two of Marvel production shows, Gem and My Little Pony and Friends. Literally the only reason I brought this up is because of how confusing it was to see edited into Vitamine on the trivia section of the My Little Pony and Friends IMDB page and having to look up articles all in French about what this thing even was and then seeing Brave Star, I mean Black Star, and having even more questions. Anyway, the block ran from 1983 to 1987, and aired from noon to around 5.30 at night. The Moochick Has Dementia In case you haven't been clued in already, the Moochick is this old wizard character who helps Megan and the other ponies sometimes. He's really forgetful, goes on tangents, and doesn't know what he's talking about half the time. The theory goes that because of his old age, he suffers from some sort of mental deterioration. They never tell us how old he is in the specials, the movie, or the show, so there's like a 50-50 chance you could even consider this theory. Majesty Offspring According to what we've seen of the My Little Pony and Friends show bible, Majesty was supposed to make an appearance in Rescue at Midnight Castle, but never did. It's weird since she comes with Dream Castle, which is featured in the special, and also in the My Little Pony fact file, comics and such, Majesty is sort of a ruler to the other ponies, and is skilled with magic. Though she never appears in the show, we do have the princess ponies, who control all of the magic in Ponyland from their castle. Could these ponies be the offspring or heirs of Majesty? Or maybe they fill the role that she was supposed to play in the show. Pillow Talk Pillow Talk is the name of a pony released in year 5 as part of the Slumber Party gift set. The term Pillow Talk can be used to just mean a close conversation between two lovers that happens in bed, though in modern context at least, it's usually a conversation that happens after intercourse. From what I found about the term, the more risque context might date back to before the pony was even released. There was a movie called Pillow Talk from 1959 that almost had its name changed for being too scandalous. Also fun fact, Tony Randall, who voiced the Moochick in My Little Pony and Friends, plays a character in that movie. In 1985, most likely the year this pony was designed, the term was on a decline in usage, so maybe they just assumed that people wouldn't associate the pony's name with sex? Smooth is made of damned souls. What are all the faces on the smooths? Are they all part of the same being, or is this thing an amalgamation of different souls, different consciousnesses, all bound together and forced to destroy everything in their path? It kind of makes me think of the River Styx from Disney's Hercules, with all the people in it. I would add in a little thing about how they all might be in pain too, but the smooths managed to sing a whole song, so I think they're uncomfortable at most. Custom Bait Custom Bait is a term used to describe damaged ponies that aren't restored by the current seller whether because they're damaged beyond reasonable repair, 
or for whatever other reason. In the most extreme cases, these are essentially sold for scrap parts or bases to custom makers, so some, according to my little wiki, are easy fixes and can be restored. Danny X Surprise. This is a ship between the human character Danny and the pony Surprise. It's not hinted at by the show, oh god no, they're just shown to have a close friendship, especially in the episode The Great Rainbow Caper. But them just being friends doesn't mean that fans don't ship them. Weirdos. Main Rust. More commonly referred to as Tail Rust, occurs on the metal washer inside the pony's bodies. This spreads out to their tail, creating a brown or reddish stain. You can usually prevent tail rust by removing the washer or clamp that's attached to the pony's tail. You can remove rust using, get this, rust remover as well as toothpaste. Now, this is pretty gross, but even more gross than tail rust is the Betty by Eye Rust, which gives the already uncanny looking baby ponies a sickening brownish red eye color. 1986 Czechoslovakia Lead Poisoning Incident In the year 1986, an unlicensed version of My Little Pony that used almost identical molds was manufactured in Czechoslovakia. Although the molds used contained hazardous levels of lead, which seeped into the plastic solution that was used to make the ponies, Exovinyl 621. If you want to look into it, just look up My Little Pony E621. This entry is a joke, um, don't look that up if you do not want to see nasty things. There is no Czechoslovakian bootleg of My Little Pony that caused people to have lead poisoning. I put that on the iceberg chart just so I could fill up space. George Dunsay, True Creator George Dunsay is an executive at Hasbro who is instrumental in gaining the license from Takara to create what we now know as the Transformers. He also did work on other iconic franchises, including My Little Pony. Although, there is a discrepancy between him and Bonnie Zachary, who many fans, including me, claim to be the true creator of the brand. Zachary apparently pitched the idea of a horse toy to Hasbro several times before My Little Pony, but was turned down because Hasbro didn't think it would appeal to little girls. To quote Bonnie, quoting Hasbro, Little girls like to cook and clean and iron. Little girls aren't like you. In 1981, Hasbro's Romper Room division, under Dunsay and with Zachary as designer, created My Pretty Pony, which was spun off into My Little Pony after the suggestion that it should be smaller and softer. Bonnie would lead this redesign, making the realistic colored prototypes that were mentioned earlier. Before it took off, Hasbro never really believed in MLP or Zachary Lee's idea. They originally weren't even going to sell it because, again, they didn't think it would have any appeal. If My Little Pony never did have any appeal and never took off, do you still think the who's the true creator argument would exist? I don't know. All I'm saying is that if Pony wasn't a hit, George might not have wanted to take as much credit for it. Slash LH. Pony Cancer. The last thing you'd want in your G1 ponies would be plastic born fungus, but as it turns out, that might be what you get. Pony cancer, sometimes referred to as smooths, refers to several types of mold and fungus that can infect the plastic on a pony. Mold comes in several different types. Pin dot mold is mold that appears as tiny dots on a pony's body. This type of mold is contagious, believe it or not. So if a pony has this type, it needs to be quarantined. Fungi that live on the surface of the ponies often cause these brown spots like the one shown here. They also need to be quarantined so that the fungus doesn't spread through the air to the other ponies. The fungus is also less likely to spread in less humid areas, so keeping humidity low when dealing with pony fungus is the key. From all the sites I've seen, the terminology used, like pony cancer and especially smooths, is pretty shaky. Smooths sometimes means mold, or fungus, or both, or dirt that gets into the plastic. Pony cancer is also confused with regrind, and the term pony cancer is also used by some people to describe the general deterioration of the plastic. Hot dog horse meat. In the My Little Pony movie, Baby Lickety Split gets called a hot dog as an insult by who I'm going to assume is Baby Lofty. This is possibly a reference to how hot dogs are often thought to contain horse meat. I mean, they do in some parts of the world. Stranger Things Brony. In Season 3 of the hit Netflix series Stranger Things, the character Dustin reveals that he enjoys My Little Pony because of its elements of fantasy and adventure. However, he says that in the latest episode of My Little Pony, Applejack gets captured and transformed into a dragon. What he's referring to is Rescue at Midnight Castle, which is a special. It aired as part of the My Little Pony and Friends series, but not until November of 1986. Stranger Things Season 3 takes place in the summer of 1985. Not only did Dustin incorrectly refer to the first My Little Pony special as an episode, he also must not have been aware that Escape from Katrina was the most recent MLP outing, being produced in March of 1985. Hashtag fake fan. 
And if we're on the topic of like inaccuracies involving MLP stuff that takes place in the past, I should also mention the Alicorn Twilight plush in Black Widow. There's a scene that takes place in like 1994, but there's a G4 plush. How hard would it have been to track down a G1 style plush, or even just get a random plush of some public domain animal? Wow, Boy, I, I sure really hope somebody, somebody was fired for that blunder. Plush. First staring in 1992 on the Disney Channel, My Little Pony Tales follows seven young ponies as they go through everyday slice of life situations. Unlike its prequel series, My Little Pony and Friends, My Little Pony Tales was set in our world with modern technology and culture. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the show was some sort of obscure gem or that you're really missing anything by not watching it, but I like it. It's a guilty pleasure. It has some fun moments, whether intentional or not, and I'd recommend it if you want some cozy MLP content, but don't want to pick up G3. But you're not here to hear my review of the show, you're here for an iceberg video. Now, My Little Pony Tales is a weird show. There's a lot of stuff that just doesn't make sense or is too strange not to bring up. Plus, given how short its run was, only getting 13 22 minute episodes, you can get a lot more thorough with picking stuff apart. And that's exactly what I did when I came up with this beast of an iceberg. Look at this thing, this is bigger than the first Wrench of its Magic one I did. Well, just sit back, relax, and get comfy because today we're going to be exploring the My Little Pony Tales iceberg. Starting with... Layer 1. The Sky. These are things that people who are only fans of G4 or have only heard of the show in passing know about. G2 Misconception. Though Tales was the second My Little Pony series to be released, it's not part of Generation 2. Generation 2 was in the late 90s, and is somewhat obscure due to it not getting any sort of animated adaptation. Despite this, many fans referred to Tales as G2 back in the early 2010s. The misconception even made it into the 2012 documentary Bronies, where it was presented as a fact. Nowadays, people just refer to the show as G1.5 or Generation 1.5. First version of Bon Bon. Sweetie Drops, aka Bon Bon, was a popular background character from G4. There, she has a tan coat and a pink slash navy blue colored mane. In Tales, we see a different version of Bon Bon. This one not only has a different color scheme, but a different cutie mark. This Bon Bon is also a main character and is obviously younger than her G4 counterpart. Another main character is named Starlight, who obviously shares a name with Starlight Glimmer. Though, the latter could be a coincidence. Derpy nicknamed Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes is another main character from the show. Apparently, Bright Eyes was a name that was thrown around when Hasbro wanted to change Derpy's name to something less insulting. During that whole controversy in G4. I could only find three places that mentioned this in total, one being a Mr. Enter video, so take this one with a grain of salt. I've actually yet to find any official merchandise with Derpy labeled as Bright Eyes. Let's feed her to the volcano. This refers to a scene in the episode Ponies in Paradise, where the character Sweetheart has a fantasy about a pony being thrown into a volcano by some island natives. The scene is sort of a meme, being shared around whenever the show is brought up. Out of context, it's confusing and hilarious, although I can't imagine how many people have seen this and didn't know it was one of the characters' imaginations. Like, wow, this show is metal. They have volcano sacrifices and everything. Teddy's Unhinged Jaw A frame in the episode The Great Lemonade Stand Wars shows the character Teddy's jaw opening after having it closed shut. For context, the lemonade he was drinking had too much sugar. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. But, weird looking smear frames in animation aren't uncommon, especially with something that's honestly super cheap looking like My Little Pony Tales. This one just stands out due to how much it's been spread around and how weird it looks. This is only one frame though, unlike something we'll get to on the next level. Layer 2, Tip of the Iceberg. Here we get to the stuff that people who've at least looked into the show will recognize. If you watched, say, the Familiar Faces video or any other reviews by, you know, I already said his name once, I think that's enough, you'll get this stuff. Teddy's Bear. Despite being portrayed as a tough guy, Teddy sleeps with a teddy bear. Not the most embarrassing thing ever, but the showwriters like to pretend that it is. Multiple episodes in the series deal with Teddy's secret almost being revealed to other ponies. Lancer Teddy Bear Frame. In the episode Shop Talk, when Lancer finds out about Teddy sleeping with a teddy bear, his face does this. Unlike Teddy's weird jaw, this one lasts longer and can't be classified as some sort of smear fame or in-between. Bon Bon is fat. Bon Bon's two defining characteristics are A. She eats a lot, B. She loves to bake. Judging by this, it's safe to say that Bon Bon would be... you know. 
Another piece of evidence might be the episode of The Masquerade, where Bonbon bon becomes insecure about telling her friends that she wants to be a model. This could mean that she's insecure about her body type. Bikini Shot in the same episode, we see Bon Bon's fantasy, where she lives out a dream of becoming a famous model. During the scene, she wears clothes that don't really make sense on a pony's body. Why would a four-legged horse need to cover up her chest area? Making these weirder is the fact that she and the rest of the main cast are supposed to be kids. Yeah, kids. Unnatural hooves. In the show, the pony's hooves, as well as the rest of their bodies, don't move like a horse's. Well, obviously, it's a cartoon, but I think suspension of disbelief can only go so far. Out of every generation, this is the one where ponies are seen standing on their hind legs the most, making you question, how does their anatomy even work? You also see them doing things like holding a pencil or using a telephone with their hooves, bending them in ways that shouldn't be possible. I guess Lyra was wrong. These little ponies can push a cart and drive a car. Bad songs. Every 11 minute segment of My Little Pony Tales has its own song. Most are forgettable and some are downright awful. Most of the main seven's voice actresses don't sing all that well. There's some exceptions though, but we'll talk about those later. Friendship is magic, similar character dynamics. The main seven in Tails, though obviously not an inspiration, can be seen as parallels to some of the main characters from G4. You have the bookworm, the sporty one, the one who likes baking, the sweet one, the well-rounded one, the one who focuses on their looks, and the clumsy one with a purple and green color scheme. Love interests slash antagonists. The boy ponies in the show are framed as both love interests and antagonists for the main seven. In one episode, Teddy and Ace will be tormenting the main characters, and in the next, they'll be the object of their affection. They also like to switch up their personality sometimes when the story calls for it. Like, Lancer is supposed to be the nice one, but in Shop Talk, he's portrayed as a bully. And in The Great Lemonade Stand Wars, Ace is supposed to be the mean one, when that role would better be suited for Teddy. Overall, it's a weird writing choice that doesn't work all that well. Hey, what ha okay, this is turning into a review. Next, next thing. Pro blackmail message. Going back to the episode Shop Talk, the episode ends with Sweetheart and Teddy blackmailing Ace and Lancer with this picture, inadvertently telling kids that, hey, you know, you know, blackmail is actually okay sometimes. That's like Bullwinkle the Moose telling kids to rip the knobs off their TV. Layer 3, Into the Iceberg. If you understand these, you've probably looked a little deeper into the show than most people. Main Seven Secret Confessions. In the episode Bon Bon's Diary, the Main Seven all describe their secrets that they don't want anybody to know. Bright Eyes got locked in a library overnight, Clover accidentally broke her mom's vase, the Main Seven's teacher Miss Hackney is Starlight's personal advisor, Patch is afraid of mice, Melody has a secret hiding place in the woods, and Sweetheart likes Teddy. Well, that last one's not much of a secret, half the episodes in the show revolve around it. Greenwing Songbird The Greenwing Songbird is a bird that was thought to be extinct in Ponyland until Bright Eyes, Ace, and Bon Bon discovered a nest of them in the episode Birds of a Feather. It's unknown why there are so few of them, either they were hunted to near extinction, or their habitat could have been destroyed by deforestation or pollution. Stock plots reused by FIM The episodes and the winner is, and the impractical joker, bear a striking resemblance to the Friendship is Magic episodes, The Ticketmaster, and 28 Pranks Later, respectively. The first two deal with characters getting two tickets to an event and having to choose someone to go with. The other two have a character getting pranked after pulling jokes on other characters for the whole episode. These are pretty common stock plots that you see cartoons use, so there's bound to be some overlap between the two shows. Cleveland Bays is a horse pun. The Cleveland Bays are a band that the main seven listen to in the show. We don't hear any songs from them, though it's assumed there's some sort of rock or new wave band. The band's name derives from a breed of horse from England. So maybe they're Britpop? I don't know. PTV. PTV is an in-universe TV channel from the show. An obvious nod to MTV, which was popular around the time the show came out. Stock laugh sound effects and intro. During the intro to the show, this stock laugh sound effect can be heard not one, not two, but three times. During the shot of the characters on the bus, when they leave school, and at the ice cream shop. Adopted Patch. In the episode Princess Problems, Patch is revealed to be an orphan. This ties into the episode's plot of her being confused for the long lost daughter of some royal family. But it makes you wonder, what happened to or where are her real parents? Squire's Ghost. Squire is the main character of a story that Patch tells the rest of the main seven in the episode Slumber Party. According to the story, Squire was a young pony who lived during the medieval times, 
and attempted to tame a dragon named Basil. At the end of the episode, the ghost of Squire appears to Patch and thanks her for telling his story, before flying away. Pegasi and Alicorns Every character in My Little Pony Tales is an Earth Pony, except for these ponies that Patch sees in the episode Up Up and Away that save her and Bon Bon from being eaten by sharks. This is actually the first appearance of an Alicorn in the entire My Little Pony franchise. Roll Around the Clock Dance Partners During the episode Roll Around the Clock, most of the main seven team up with these incidental boy ponies. The only ones we see again are Teddy, Ace, and Lancer. What happened to the other ones? And why does this one look like Brony Dance Party? Bumpers on Tubi release. If you watch My Little Pony Tales on the site Tubi, you'll be greeted with these bumpers for the show after the intro and between each 11 minute segment. Most bumpers from this time period are completely lost, so it's great they were able to preserve something like this. Another thing about the Tubi release is that the episodes are out of order on there, Bon Bon's Diary is labeled as the first, when Slumber Party is the actual first episode. Amnesia. In the episode Send in the Clown, Clover suddenly gets amnesia as some sort of response to the stress of having to perform on stage. This barely has any impact on the episode and is a weird non sequitur that comes out of nowhere and goes away in like two minutes. Battle of the Bands, Cell Shadow. In the episode Battle of the Bands, they do this focus effect with Dazzle in the front and Melody's band in the background. Since the show was made using traditional cell animation, you get this jarring look to it where you can see the shadow of the frame on the background in HD releases of the show. It's actually a really neat little detail. Pony Settlers Pony Settlers are a group of ponies who moved to Ponyland from god knows where. In the episode An Apple for Starlight, the ponies explore an abandoned cave where the settlers supposedly stayed once they moved to Ponyland. Apparently, nobody besides the settlers ever explored the cave. That's weird. Is there something in there we're not supposed to see? Intertwining Tail Handshake This is something that ponies will do in the earlier episodes of the show. As sort of a pony equivalent to a high five, they'll swirl their tails together. This only happens a few times in the show, and is one of the only instances of them taking advantage of the fact that the characters are actually horses. Environmentalist Messages Environmentalism was a big trend in children's media and pop culture in general during the late 80s and early 90s. We can see a few examples of this in My Little Pony Tales, Bright Eyes dreams of protecting the environment when she grows up, Clover's dad gets upset with her for polluting the river in the episode Out of Luck, and in the final episode, the ponies set out on a journey to find out who's polluting all of Ponyland, only to find out that it's them, and not the factories and power plants that are dumping their trash everywhere. Yeah, sure, let's go with that. Canadian Accents Just like Friendship is Magic, My Little Ponytails was produced in Canada. As a result, some of the characters have noticeable Canadian accents when saying certain words. One big one is Sorry, which is pronounced as Sorry by almost all of the main seven. Curse Teapot In the episode Out of Luck, Clover finds a teapot that apparently grants wishes, except every wish of hers gets twisted. But not in the clever monkey's paw sort of way, it just makes random things go wrong whenever she wishes for something. Examples of this include her wishing for it to rain money, but instead just raining, and her wishing for the main seven's clubhouse to be fixed, but accidentally getting a bucket of glue dropped on her head. So, is the teapot actually just cursed? Melody and Firefly, similar color scheme. Melody and the My Little Pony and Friends character Firefly have the exact same color scheme, leading to some confusion from people regarding certain pieces of merchandise. So just remember, if you see some My Little Pony stuff out in the wild, and there's a pink pony with a blue mane, Firefly is a Pegasus, and Melody is an Earth Pony. That distinction can save your life someday, kids. Speaking of... Coin Ride. There's a coin-operated My Little Pony ride from the early 90s that bears a striking resemblance to Melody in terms of both color and hairstyle. Though, Melody doesn't have a bow around her tail in the show, and the cutie mark is a generic star design. So, it's not Melody, or Firefly, it's just some random pink pony. Bon Bon and Teddy Teddy and Sweetheart are a canon couple in the show, although one episode teases out a relationship between Teddy and Bon Bon. Could this mean that the writers originally had a relationship with them instead of Teddy and Sweetheart? Yeah, probably not, but it's weird for a show with such a rigid continuity like My Little Pony Tales to do something like this. I imagine you wouldn't have time to tease at any ships besides the default canon ones. What am I talking about? The show came out in 1992! Layer 4, The Depths This is where we get into the more minute details and trivia from the show, and even some stuff outside the show itself. Regional DVDs. 
I made a whole video about this, but My Little Ponytails has some weird overseas DVD releases. From Swedish ones that look like they were drawn in MS Paint, to Italian ones that look suspiciously close to G5's art style. Vase for Flowers In the song Secrets, Clover laments how she broke her mom's favorite vase for flowers. The line is supposed to mean that she broke the vase that happened to hold flowers, but the way the line is delivered, it sounds like she needed the flowers for something and broke the vase to get them. Modernized MLP Cycle People who look into the earlier generations of MLP might start to notice a trend where at the end of every successful generation of the toy line, G1 did it with Tails, G3 did it with the Ponyville spin-off line, and G4 did it with Pony Life. Weird how it's never worked, and yet Hasbro's done it three times already. British Phrases Due to something I'll get to further down the iceberg, Tails has a few British phrases snuck into the dialogue, like Bon Bon using the word cinema instead of theater, and the word cross being used in place of angry or mad. Returning voice actresses Quite a few of the actresses from My Little Pony Tales return to the franchise for minor roles in G3 or G4. Examples include Melody's voice actress playing Starlight Glimmer, or Bon Bon's actress playing Daring Do. Suspensefulmusic.wav This refers to a song that plays in basically every episode during the climax or in some sort of chase scene. One example is the beehive scene in Birds of a Feather. Stolen Songs Pause this video and go listen to the song Sweet Music. Sounds familiar, right? The melody is pretty generic, and it sounds nothing like the other songs from the show. But what song specifically is it ripping off? Let me know in the comments what you guys think, because I swear I've heard this tune before, or at least something similar. Slavery.jpg This refers to a Tumblr post containing a screenshot from the episode Princess Problems, where two stallions are pulling a carriage. The OP says, this confuses me on so many levels, before another poster replies simply with, Slavery. Miss Hackney's Mane While all the other ponies have real-world human hairstyles, Miss Hackney's Mane looks like this. Is she supposed to be wearing a… tiny hat? What does the real-world equivalent to this even look like? Barrington Newborn Name Confusion In the episode The Tea Party, the ponies meet their new neighbors, the Barringtons. The mom says that their new baby's name is Posey, but a second later, Sweetheart calls the baby Cherry. So which name is the right one? Why did they mess it up? Was it a thing with the voice actors, or was it a thing with the script? Now I just picture two people in the writer's room, back in 1992, having a heated argument about what this incidental baby should be named. Baby Pony Real Name On the topic of baby names, in the episode Too Sick to Notice, we see Bon Bon's baby brother, simply referred to as Baby Pony. So is his name Pony? I mean, Bon Bon has like 8 other siblings, so honestly they might have just ran out ideas on what to name their kids at that point. Bon Bon slash Sweetheart slash Clover voice swap. In multiple episodes, the main seven will swap voices on certain lines. For example, you'll have Bright Eyes' voice coming out of Bon Bon's mouth, or Bon Bon's voice coming out of Clover's mouth. Most instances of this aren't all that interesting, except for in the episode The Tea Party, where Bon Bon apologizes to herself for accidentally hitting herself with a slingshot. Grainy Flashlight Whenever something like the headlights on a van, a spotlight, or a flashlight is shown, they'll use this overlay effect that makes everything under it look extremely grainy. At least that's how it looks in HD releases of the show. They probably just layered a translucent cell over the foreground because that would be cheaper than redrawing the whole frame over again. Patch and Squire Related This theory goes that the reason Patch is the only one who's able to see Squire's ghost is that the two are a part of the same bloodline. That kind of makes sense if you add Patch being adopted as a variable. Since we don't know who her birth parents are, it's entirely possible that she could be Squire's long-lost descendant. Clover lowballed for the tickets. In the episode and the winner is, Clover sells her two concert tickets in order to buy pizza for her friends. Considering how highly sought after the tickets are, you'd think that she'd be able to get more than one pizza to share between seven ponies. So did Clover just get a lousy deal on the tickets? Well, this is Clover we're talking about, so there's a good chance she just took the first offer for them without thinking it through at all. UK Exclusive Toys Although the show never aired there, My Little Pony Tales was marketed heavily in the UK with exclusive toys and other merchandise, including something that we'll discuss on the next layer. Hanging with Past Friends This refers to the name of a card made for the open source card game Twilight Sparkle's Secret Shipfic folder. That was made by Chris Chan. The card was made using an animation cell of Clover that was purchased from the last BronyCon in 2019. Along with Clover, we have the original character Nightstar and some text that reads, Years after Nightstar accidentally slipped forward in time as a filly, she mastered her time spells and went back to live the years she missed, 
She was good friends with the main seven of the quote-unquote second generation. She delighted with enlightening the group with her wisdom and sharing in their moments. In this moment, she was telling Clover how she is capable of making her own good luck. 80s period piece. Although the show came out in the early 90s, the overall feel of the world, the music, the fashion, and a lot of other designs feel very late 80s. So does this mean the show is technically a late 80s period piece? With horses? Year 5 Bright Eyes. There was actually a pony named Bright Eyes that was released before the show. This pony had a different color scheme as well as a different cutie mark, having a clock instead of a notebook. The pony was made during Year 5 the toy line as part of the Twinkle Eye series of figures. 4chan smiled on me. This refers to a clip from the episode Out of Luck where Clover says the word fortune, but it could also be misheard as 4chan. Clover also has, well, a clover for a cutie mark. Yeah, look out Anon Philly, there's a new slash MLP mascot in town. Layer 5, Diving Deeper. This is where we start to get into some of the more crazy stuff. UFO Parts. In the episode The Impractical Joker, Starlight comments how the main seven were able to build a near-perfect UFO replica with cardboard and Christmas lights. What kind of cardboard and Christmas lights make a metal sound when you hit it? And how is it able to support three whole ponies? Yeah, Starlight, just say your dad helped you. Mint leaves. In The Great Lemonade Stand Wars, Bonbon bon says that the lemonade her mom makes contains mint leaves as a key ingredient. I was gonna make a weed joke until I realized that's an actual thing that people do. Still could be a little something something in there though, you know? Teddy's parents gave him the bear. We never see Teddy's parents in the show. The only two things that he's really close to are Sweetheart and his teddy bear. What if the reason that Teddy holds on to his bear is because it's the only thing he has to remember his deceased parents by? You know, like in Rhapsody Street Kids. The Christmas Pony. Speaking of Christmas, in the final episode, this ice cream delivery man references a figure called the Christmas Pony. Is that just their version of Santa Claus, or is it something completely different? Like in G3, Christmas being canon in the Pony universe raises a few questions. Like, does Pony Christ exist? We see some sort of church in the intro for a couple of frames, so it's not off the table. Starlight is a Mary Sue. Starlight really doesn't have any defining characteristics outside of being the leader and hanging out with all the other ponies. She only gets one spotlight episode, and that's one where she's shipped with one of the male characters for the whole thing. Her presence in the show feels like somebody's self-insert character. Like the SNT or that one emo fish from Spongebob, but for My Little Pony. Coca-Cola Product Placement During the song in the episode The Impractical Joker, Clover and Bonbon bon refer to Coke by name. Although Coke is a catch-all term for soda in some regions of the United States, it's still weird to hear. There's a possibility that they even had to pay to use the name just to have the song rhyme. Ponyland Sovereignty is Ponyland a country, city, state, or planet? In the aforementioned episode, Patch says, Thank you for coming to Ponyland. Why not say, Welcome to Earth? You wouldn't say, Welcome to America, or Welcome to X City if you made contact with aliens. In some instances, they refer to Ponyland as some sort of country or state, like in Ponies in Paradise where the tropical island is just another part of Ponyland. If it's a state or country, who's the leader? What type of government do they have? Theodore Roosevelt is canon. The name Teddy Bear derives from the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. So, would that mean it's the same case for the bear in the show? That answers my previous question, in that Ponyland's government could be a parallel of our United States. Well, our, at, le at least people who live in the US. So, at the time the show takes place, the president could either be a pony Ronald Reagan, or a pony George H.W. Bush. A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Sunglasses This is only so low on the iceberg because it's a reference to a horror movie, but the glasses that Lancer wears in Roll Around the Clock look similar to the ones that Jesse wears during the iconic bedroom dance scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. It's a coincidence, sure, but it could also be a hint at Lancer's sexuality. Shop Talk writers had a diaper fetish. In Shop Talk, Lancer and Ace are blackmailed with these embarrassing photos of them dressed up as babies. The way the scene plays out, lingering on them happily dressed up and indulging themselves in baby-like behaviors to get these two to drink their milk, and the way it ends with them getting you know what, I'm not gonna- I'm not even gonna describe it. Just look it up for yourself, it, it feels wrong. Like, wow, I didn't know Sophie LaBelle worked on this show. Pony Years versus Human Years It's a mystery how old the characters are supposed to be. In some episodes, they're coded as teenagers, and others, they're coded as younger kids. In Happy Birthday Sweetheart, she turns 10 years old, leading me to believe that there has to be some difference between the way ponies in the show age and the way that humans in our world age. My best guess is that one pony year is around one and a half human years. 
making the main seven at least 14. Comics My Little Ponytail has had a few comics that were released in the UK. The art for these is nothing special, but reminds me a lot of G3. They're obviously meant to appeal to little, little kids, so the writing is nothing groundbreaking, but it's still cool to see these characters in another art style. Oh, we also get some confirmation on the Bonbon bon being fat, or at least being insecure about her body type thing. True meaning of cutie marks. A lot of the ponies' cutie marks don't really make sense when you think about them. Like, Bonbon bon makes sense, she likes sweets. Bright Eyes likes to read and write, she's the smart one. Sweetheart is, well, a sweetheart, and Melody does music. But what about Patch and Starlight? Well, Starlight I get, cause she's a generic one. What about Teddy? Does he have a secret passion for like, cutting hair? And Miss Hackney, what does this too mean? Is her cutie mark counting down her years until retirement? Maybe it's her number of victims. Sunny Lookalike The minor character Half Note has a similar color scheme and main style to Sunny from the upcoming G5 movie. Yeah, that's really it. They sure do look alike. Why was Bon Bon grounded? In the episode Battle of the Bands, Bon Bon has to talk to Melody in secret due to her being grounded. They never say why though. There are multiple instances in the show where Bon Bon does things that could get her in trouble, like attacking their new neighbors, sharing her mom's secret lemonade recipe, ditching school to explore an old cave, ditching school to fly in a hot air balloon, running away from the school dance and almost dying, faking being sick for attention, and stealing ice cream from an ice cream delivery truck. Layer 6, Below the Iceberg, the second to last level. This is where we get into the more bizarre theories and headcanons for the show. Teddy and Sweetheart, Codependent Relationship Teddy and Sweetheart model a real-life abusive relationship. Teddy repeatedly causes trouble for Sweetheart and all of her friends makes up for it occasionally to the point where Sweetheart can forgive him and then goes back to being himself. It obviously wasn't their intent to portray them like this. I'm guessing they wanted Teddy to be a jerk with a heart of gold. But the way it plays out in the show makes it look like he's taking advantage of Sweetheart's, you know, sweetness. Clover is jinxed. In multiple episodes, people say that Clover always has good luck due to the Clover on her cutie mark, but more often than not, it's the opposite. Clover is clumsy, always tripping and falling over, and all the episodes where good things happen to her, they actually make her life worse. She wins the concert tickets, but then gets wrapped up in a dilemma of having to choose which friend to go with, she gets a magical teapot that grants wishes, but all the wishes go horribly wrong. Maybe the reason her life is like this is because of everybody telling her how lucky she is. There's that old notion that if you say something good will happen, it's less likely to actually happen. That's probably the case with her, and her cutie mark is more of a curse than anything. Patch is delusional. This theory goes that Patch suffers from delusions or hallucinations of some kind, and as a result is the only one who sees any of the supernatural occurrences in the show. The Glowing Ponies and Squire's Ghost are examples of this. She's also been shown to believe in UFOs and sea monsters. Maybe just an overactive imagination? Maybe something a little bit darker? But if the Glowing Ponies and Up Up and Away aren't real, how did they survive the balloon trip? Maybe Patch didn't even get in the balloon at all. We see her have a fantasy sequence in the same episode, so it could be part of that. Arthur Precursor So, there's this show. The show came out in the 90s and features a cast of anthropomorphic animals. The main characters are supposed to be young kids, but have a weird level of independence that you don't see at their age. They're also voiced by relatively young actors. Of course, I'm talking about My Little Pony Tales, but there are quite a few similarities to PBS Kids' Arthur. Along with the previously mentioned ones, there also happens to be an episode where the characters think somebody's getting married to one person who actually turns out to be their sister. A plot both shared by Sister of the Bride and the iconic Gay Rat Wedding episode. I'm not saying that Arthur ripped off My Little Pony Tales, but they do give me similar vibes. Or maybe Bon Bon just sounds like DW, I don't know. The Coltonville Anomaly This is a theory proposed by an anon on 4chan's MLP board, that the entirety of Ponyland that we see in My Little Pony Tales is made up, and the main seven are actually G1 ponies who were trapped in there by some sort of villain. The Pegasi and Alicorn could have been other ponies trying to save them from this pocket dimension, if you think about it, a lot of the show's inconsistencies start to make sense once you consider the theory. Main characters based on Stephen King's It The ten main ponies that we see in the show can be seen as parallels to the child characters in Stephen King's 1986 novel, It. First, you have the main seven. The fat one, the class clown, the smart one who hangs out at the library a lot, the nervous one, the one who ends up neglecting the younger sibling, the one who's in an abusive relationship, and the one who isn't seen for much of the runtime. There are also three bully characters who torment the main seven, one being the leader with the Napoleonic Complex. 
Fire Escape Slide. In the intro, the ponies slide down this slide to leave school. We never see it in the actual series, though. This might be an abstract visual, like the ones at the end of the intro, or it could be some weird fire escape that we never see get used in the actual show. That would mean there'd have to be a fire at the school, though. Lost episode? Post-apocalyptic Earth. There's actually a lot of evidence for this theory. Well, it obviously goes that My Little Pony Tales takes place in a post-apocalyptic version of our world where ponies happen to take over. In the show, things like telephones, guitars, pencils, etc. are made for human hands, not hooves. Teddy bears, and thus Teddy Roosevelt exist, so that must mean the ponies know at least something about human history. And the most damning piece of evidence, in An Apple for Starlight, we see both a globe and a drawing depicting our Earth. Our Earth. In that same episode, they talk about the pony settlers and how they journeyed from some far off place to what they now know as Ponyland. This could be referring to the very instant that ponies began to recover what was left of the human world. Notice how they say pony settlers and not just settlers. Cancelled Sega Genesis game. I made this up, but wouldn't it be cool though? There was a game called Crystal's Ponytail on the Genesis that looks like a My Little Pony product, but these things are completely unrelated. Also, if anything, Crystal's Ponytail would be based on the first G1 series, judging by the game's fantasy setting. Lost YouTube Poops There are a lot of obscure YouTube poops that have been lost to time due to copyright strikes. There are two I can think of that were actually from My Little Ponytails. I remember watching these one night on my mom's phone when I couldn't sleep. Good times. One was every My Little Pony theme song from G1 to G4, but every instance of the word pony was replaced with pingas. Yeah, it was 2013. The other one was a YouTube poop of the Slumber Party episode, featuring a Sparta remix of the scene where the ponies make an ice cream sundae. I remember looking for these a few months ago, but got no results on YouTube. Maybe somebody has the link to these, or possibly could have downloaded one of them? It's a shot in the dark, but if you do, let me know in the comments. I want to watch the Sparta remix one again. Misandrist Propaganda In the show, the male characters are portrayed as loud, rude, gluttonous, smelly, self-absorbed, etc. The only males who aren't characterized this way are the girl's fathers, and the one guy who has a lot of money. Were the show writers trying to send little girls the message that men don't deserve respect and can't be trusted? Is what people would say if the show came out today. Lancer's Family Fortune Lancer's family is shown to be extremely rich. Rich enough to afford a mansion, a yacht with a full crew, and the materials for a big ass lemonade stand like this one. So where does this money come from? They never specify what Lancer's dad does for a living, but hopefully it's something legal. And ethical. I mean, war profiteering, drug trafficking, it's open to interpretation, honestly. Insulin-dependent Bonbon. The reason that Bonbon eats so much could be that she was born with type 1 diabetes. People who are type 1 diabetic don't produce enough blood sugar, so they need to eat more to balance it out. Or at least that's how it worked in Paul Blart. It makes sense if you consider things like her eating in the middle of class, or going through a week's worth of food in like half a day. Nuclear Reactor in Ice Cream Shop This is a reference to a joke from the old Familiar Faces My Little Pony retrospective. The intro has a shot of the ponies running into the ice cream shop, with the cone above the door having this weird flashing effect that we never see in the show, leading Chad Rocco to joke about it being powered by a nuclear reactor. Given all the other weird stuff that happens in the show, I doubt that this would be too far-fetched honestly. If they did a season 2, there'd probably be an episode about it. Rainbow Rocks based on Battle of the Bands episode. Both of them deal with characters entering into a Battle of the Bands, but besides that, they aren't too similar. I mean, maybe the Dazzlings were a nod to Dazzle, the TV host from the episode? Then again, like Starlight, it could be a coincidence. Blonde Sweetheart Apparition. In the episode, and the winner is, a white pony with yellow hair appears for a split second. I know this is supposed to be Bright Eyes based on the hairstyle and the fact that she's the only one not in the shot, but I don't know, it just looks like Blonde Sweetheart to me. Let's just call her, uh, Shiny Sweetheart. Lair 7. The Abyss. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Patch Coma slash Death Dream Theory. This theory goes that Patch being saved by the glowing ponies was actually something her mind conjured up in the last seconds of life before she was devoured by sharks or drowned in the ocean. Every episode after Up, Up, and Away is either an extension of this dream or a version of her afterlife where she and Bon Bon now reside. Show CT. 
Show CT refers to a green text post from 4chan's MLP board, which depicts Patch being tormented by a vision of Anon who lives in her closet. The post goes on to mention how Patch takes meds for hallucinations and has her lashing out at Bonbon bon for suggesting that Anon isn't real. At the end of the post, Patch goes to bed, only to find herself at the mercy of the green, faceless monster yet again. The Anti-Fim this refers to a video by former YouTuber Brony Curiosity, where he places My Little Pony Tales in direct opposition to Friendship is Magic. The modern setting of Tales versus the abstract fantasy world of FIM, FIM's focus on the power of friendship versus Tales' focus on quote-unquote the persuasion of lust, and FIM being a beacon of hope versus Tales upholding the status quo of society. As somebody who's watched both shows, I really don't agree with the points he makes, but the video is also put out in 2013, so really, what are you gonna do? Lost Season 2. Production materials apparently exist for a second season of My Little Pony Tales. A few episode scripts, as well as some rough animation can be found if you search hard enough online. I'll leave a card in the video, as well as a link in the description if you guys want to see some of it. Main 7 represents 7 deadly sins. Pretty self-explanatory. Bon Bon is gluttony because, well, obviously. Clover is envy, always wanting to be like her older sister. Melody is pride, having a high opinion of herself and letting it get to her head in the episode that plays the thing. Patch is wrath, always pranking her friends. Starlight is lust, due to her crush on Ace in the episode Just for Kicks. Sweetheart is sloth, because in the Slumber Party episode, she was the only one who actually wanted to go to sleep. It's a stretch, I know. And I guess Bright Eyes would have to be greed. Maybe instead of hoarding money, she hoards... Knowledge? Canon and G4 and G5. G4 takes place in a world with very little modern tech, and all different types of ponies living together. G5 takes place in an Equestria with different types of ponies living apart, and with 21st century technology. So, what would an in-between of these two look like? I don't know. Maybe a late 80s inspired Equestria, or Ponyland, made up of only Earth ponies while other kinds of ponies are basically forgotten? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's right, every pony, we've got another iceberg. Over the course of this channel, I've covered generations 1, 3, 4, and beyond in their own videos. It only makes sense that we'd get around to My Little Pony's second, lesser known generation. Generation 2 of My Little Pony released in the late 90s, and is mostly thought of as a failure, since it never got an animated adaptation, and nobody really remembers the toys from around that time. You know, it's relatively obscure. There's still an iceberg about it though, because of course there is. MLP fans, you know, we're just like that. Today, we're gonna go over the My Little Pony G2 Iceberg, thanks to Reddit user Lady Pangea, who compiled the iceberg, as well as helping me out with a few of the entries. Now, let's get right into it. Level 1 My Little Pony Tales Confusion This entry refers to how, a while back, people would refer to the show My Little Pony Tales as G2, when it was actually part of G1. You see, G1 had two shows. One was My Little Pony and Friends, which is way more iconic. You know, Rainbow Castle, the My Little Pony theme song. Tales came out around the end of G1 in the early 90s, way after ponies stopped being popular. Because the two were pretty separate from each other, bronies thought, well, this must be the second generation, because G1 is this show and G3 is this. This must be G2. Couldn't be further from the truth. Popularity in Europe. Turns out Europeans love tiny plastic horses. Americans like them too, but in Europe it was really bad. G2 as well as G1 continued in Europe well after they were discontinued in the US. In the US, they put out new ponies only in 1997 and 1998, but in Europe, they went all the way to 2003. For those who know their stuff, that's bordering on G3. Crazy how in Europe, there was a somewhat constant stream of releases, while in the US, they stopped in the early 90s, spurted out a few new things in the late 90s, and then in the aughts, came back with full force. Gemstone Eyes. This is probably referring to how most, if not all, G2 ponies have these little gems in their eyes. If you look at a faraway picture, you can't really see it, but if you zoom in, or get one from the right angle where the light bounces off the thing, you can totally see the gemstone. Magic Motion Magic Motion seems to be a catch-all name for a few standard gimmicks the ponies would have. Some had more articulation in their necks, others, if you pulled their tail, their head would move, another one I saw would raise their hoof. I guess this could be pretty fun during play, but it's a standard gimmick. Sundance Sundance is a prominent character from G1, who returned for G2. 
but with a different design. If it wasn't obvious already, the G1 version of the pony is white with some hearts as a cutie mark, and in G2 she has an orange coat and a balloon with a sun. McDonald's Promotion 1998 MLP has had McDonald's tie-ins from the very beginning. In 98, they partnered with Hasbro to have mini G2 brushables in Happy Meals. In the US, only three ponies were released, Ivy, Lightheart, and Sundance. The UK got lucky because they had four, the ones already in the US, plus Sweetberry. What's weird is that the UK Happy Meal toy for Sundance is listed as Sunsparkle on the My Little Wiki. Again in Europe, there was another Macca's tie-in during 1999. This time you could get Sundance, Sweetberry, Morning Glory, and Silver Swirl. These ponies also came with their own carrying case. Or something that looked like a carrying case. The 98 Happy Meal toys came out opposite a Transformers set, which for those who don't know, Hasbro owns both franchises. Level 2 already, and that's the end of the first layer. Let's move on to the second. Euro exclusive ponies. This is actually a lot of them since according to my little wiki, G2 went on for a considerably longer amount of time than G1. Says that a bit into year 2, aka 1998, that distribution in the US stopped. Indistinguishable male ponies. In other generations, male ponies could be easily distinguished from the females, either through body or face shape. In G2, the male characters use similar molds to the females. As an example, look at Clever Clover. He's got eyelashes like all the other ponies, but is supposed to be the sporty boy character. Friendship Gardens PC Game This refers to the My Little Pony game for CD-ROM released in 1998. The game is a pet simulator, where you get to take care of your own pony. You can teach her to jump, feed her, brush her hair, all that. You can also play games and do activities with some of the other ponies in town. The game has that 90s early CG render liminal space aesthetic, and the music is oddly calming. I recommend checking this one out if you like games like that. Promo art used on G1 DVDs. Not much to say with this one. Whenever they'd re-release G1 content in the late 90s, they'd use current G2 styled art for the characters. It is pretty surreal to see stuff like the My Little Ponytails gang in the style, or the G2 ponies alongside characters from the 86 My Little Pony movie. In terms of MLP home media releases, I wouldn't say it's the strangest thing they've ever done. In fact, a long time ago I made a whole video on MLP home media, so if you want more of a discussion on that, I'd recommend you check that out. Princess Ponies Princess Ponies were released throughout the course of G2, unfortunately only hitting European markets. G1 also had a variety of princess ponies released throughout its run. In G1, the princesses had gimmicks like 3D cutie marks, but it looks like these ones are only princesses in name, as well as coming with some princessy accessories. Mail Order Ponies These are ponies that could only be obtained by sending for them in the mail, either with money or proofs of purchase from other MLP products. They did this through all the early generations, and stopped with G4, since by then, you could just order everything online, and it wasn't as special to get something in the mail. There were only 5 ponies in total you could get through mail order in G2. Seabreeze came on her own, with the 4 others being part of a set. All ponies have magic powers. Okay, so before G5, where all the pony abilities were powered by magic, G2 introduced pony fans to the concept of every pony being magical. On both the back cards for the toys and the tie-in comics, all sorts of ponies are shown to have some sort of magical ability. Sweetberry, for example, can make things grow magically in her garden, and Lightheart can make her bed fly, apparently. Twin Baby Ponies Another connection to G1, both generations had twin baby pony releases. This is exactly what it sounds like. Two little ponies that came together in one pack. Both ponies in the set have the same cutie mark, so you know they're twins. Minimal Appearances of Unicorns Unicorns do show up in G2, but the ratio of them to Earth Ponies is really weird. From my research, I only found a few from the entire line none of which were released in the US. Silver Swirl seems to be the main one, being portrayed as this wise princess, kind of like Celestia from G4. Rare Petite Ponies From my research, initially, it seems like this is a fan-made thing. Somebody 3D printed these ponies with the colors and symbols of the G2 characters, but the shape of the G1 Petite Ponies. But, correction, 
These were rumored to be real, and were exclusive to a Hasbro licensing show in the 90s. The ones I'd found on Etsy were just reproductions. Beanie plushies. I'm guessing to capitalize on the Beanie Babies fad, Hasbro put out these Beanie MLP plushies. Just clarifying, these aren't official Beanie Babies, at least I don't think, since they don't have the distinctive big tie heart anywhere on them. Morning Glory and Clever Clover are a couple. A few sets feature both ponies together, like this one here. The site I found this picture on labels both the ponies as princesses. There might be something going on with that. Promo Comics As we all know by now, G2 never had a formal TV show or movie. The only outside media we have are these tie-in comics, presumably released in these magazines. Scans of these comics and stories can be found in assorted places throughout the internet. I was pointed to the Lavender Lagoon, this big G2 resource that has a few. There's also the blog Heck Yeah Pony Scans, which I've used as a resource in previous videos. Presumably, these comics only came out in the UK, since that's the only region that the Tumblr blog mentions when they link to the English version of the comics. French comics and magazines also exist, and presumably other European countries got their own. French commercials on YouTube. Exactly what it sounds like. Thankfully, a lot of the G2 commercials have been restored. Specifically, this compilation of French commercials I found that has really good quality footage, at least compared to the other rips out there. Level 4. Pony Years Last One Month. This refers to the PC game. In it, you set the birthday of your pony, and since, like the entry says, pony years are one month, every month on that day, you have a little birthday celebration. Hip Holly, aka Miss Gadget. I'm guessing this refers to the back card on this pony named Hip Holly. It reads, Hip Holly is trendy. Whatever the latest fad is, she wants to be a part of it. Her cell phone and beeper let her keep up with the hottest trends. And this is the first instance, at least from what I can tell, of a pony using a cell phone. She was literally Pip before Pip. Turns out this pony came with her own phone and beeper as accessories too. Yeah, remember beepers? I don't. I'm from the 2000s. Friend of the Fairies. This refers to a pony named Moonshadow and how in this one comic, she meets up with a group of fairies. This also confirms that fairies and possibly humans are canon in the G2 universe. Blue Haired Ivy. So, in 2000, there was this pony called Blue Pearl, who had pretty much the same cutie mark as Ivy, another pony. This Blue Pearl pony had a variant that was even more like Ivy and thus dubbed Blue Ivy by collectors. It was originally thought that she was a Spanish exclusive that came in a playset, but somebody had found a version of her released just by herself. It seems that now this Ivy is just a variant on the other one. Not entirely sure how that works. Princess Silver Swirl's Dragon Friend. We've already brought up Princess Silver Swirl. Her original release came with this green dragon guy. The dragon isn't given a name, but it's a popular headcanon that this is a G2 version of Spike. In G1, Spike was commonly seen as a companion to the princess ponies, and well, Silver Swirl is confirmed to be a princess, very similar to Majesty from G1, who Spike would mainly hang out with. Bam. Case solved, it's Spike. Cutie Mark's Changing Style. Now, by changing style, I thought this meant that throughout the generation they were using, like, a different design philosophy or something. No, this actually talks about how in certain sets, pony symbols will be different from the individual releases. Examples given are the Basket Surprise 2 pack and the Birthday Surprise pack with Lightheart and Sundance. Look for the rainbow proof on the hoof. This refers to a mark on the bottom of the pony's hooves. It's meant to show that the pony is official. G2 had very few recorded knockoffs. So I doubt that this would be a big thing, but G1 sure had a lot of ripoffs, so maybe this was just a precaution by Hasbro to make sure they had some mark of authenticity at the gate. Level 5 Japan Exclusive Keychains MLP didn't really hit Japan until after G3, at least I think so, but there were some attempts to bring it over. Most famously, Takara's My Little Pony adaptation from the 80s. There were also a few pieces of G2 merchandise released there in the 90s. It really is nothing special, just some plushes, I think, keychains, and a cell phone strap. Wow. Ponies and her family have this color eyes. First guess for this was how ponies who are sold together in family sets will have the same color eyes. I also presume you'd find this phrase on the back of some pony boxes. Dainty Dove's Sheltered Life. 
Dainty Dove is a pony whose back card and comic appearances let us know one thing and one thing about her. She really wants to get married. The back card story on her original release reads, Dainty Dove is the flighty one. Her head is always in the clouds, imagining romantic weddings. She loves to dress as a bride and magically make a sparkling ring to appear for her to wear. Her fixation on weddings could lead people to believe that she's sheltered and or has a very traditional view of things. Talking slash musical ponies. Musical Ponies came out in 2002 and 2003. If you brushed their manes, they'd play a little melody. I'm not sure what mechanism they used for that, but it's a cool feature. They also came with these little plastic horns that you could blow into, like a mini saxophone or panpipe. Moonshadow is a night owl. Moonshadow is a pony who, from her backstory, is known to be mysterious. One of the comic stories has her walking alone at night when she comes across some fairies who take her on a little adventure. This entry could be referring to how she likely would be a night owl, since everything we know about her, she likes to take walks at night, and she isn't seen by people often, would lead us to believe so. Character Name Changes A pretty self-explanatory one. If you go onto my little wiki to the G2 section and any specific character, you'll notice that their names throughout releases aren't consistent. For example, let's talk about Moonshadow again. In 1999, some packaging referred to her as Moonshine. There also is, again like we previously mentioned, Ivy and Blue Pearl, who are listed on the same my little wiki page. In fact, that could relate to the next entry. Reused cutie marks. This is a pretty common thing in pretty much every generation. Certain ponies would just have the exact same cutie mark with no explanation given. A little fun fact, they even did this on the keychains with Sweetberry's cutie mark being used for Lightheart. Globetrotter flashcards. I was actually confused about this entry at first because there's actually a pony named Globetrotter, but this isn't about her. There were actually these flashcards with ponies at real-world locations released during G2. Level 6 Are Pegasi extinct? Here's our first big theory. There don't appear to be any natural Pegasi in the G2 universe. From any of the media we've seen, the closest thing is the unicorn ponies with magic wings, but A, they'd be alicorns if they were unicorns with wings, and B, it's highly debatable if these wings are actually naturally occurring, or they just poof them up. Gabrielle McKenzie is a voice actress who isn't really well known, but she's on the iceberg because she voices pretty much every character in the Friendship Gardens video game, including the butterfly who shows you around everywhere. To our knowledge, she's the only voice actress to portray any G2 character, advertised next to the Sega Dreamcast. Now, I was very excited when I heard this entry because if you don't know already, I've got a soft spot for that specific system. Now, G2 was on the market in the very late 90s, which was when the Dreamcast was coming over to America. Now, this refers to an ad from a European magazine that has G2 ponies right next to the newly released console. And this is such an epic visual, unironically. The scan was published on a blog called Sun, Sparkle, and Rainbows, run by a Swedish collector dedicated to G2. Rare Fakies For those who don't know, Fakies is a term used to describe bootleg slash knockoff MLP products. Understandably, the G2 ones are exceptionally rare. You have the Sweetberry Fakie, released as part of a playset, and another in a box who's white. You've also got a few more like this Pegasus and some weird bald shiny ones. Sundance slash Sunsparkle is the true heir of Ponyland. Sundance, or Sunsparkle, came in a special playset with this queen's throne. Could this mean she's... a queen? Here we are, the final lair, level 7. G2 is in its own pocket dimension. I'm willing to believe this. I haven't seen any big theory videos about it, but it's been pretty much confirmed, I think, that G1, 3, 4, and 5 take place in the same continuity. But you know what doesn't fit in there? My Little Ponytails. And G2. It could be possible that G1 and G2 are so similar that they're together in the continuity, but that doesn't explain how there aren't any Pegasus ponies around. I wouldn't be opposed to thinking that G2 is outside the bounds of any other pony universe. There's clearly not enough lore to connect it to any other generations, so it's just here in this kind of limbo. Prototypes. 
Now, the prototypes for G2 are pretty well documented on Lavender Lagoon. First is this early prototype for Sunsparkle. Here, she's made out of plaster, hand-painted, and noticeably bigger than her final counterpart. Other prototypes from this specific page include these baby ponies. This pink one was found on eBay and is assumed to be a version of Baby Honeyberry. A lot of the other prototypes just show up on shopping websites or at flea markets. They're not too interesting except for these two big fashion ponies and this blank prototype with a voice box. Dutch Story CDs Now, this is another thing found on Sun Sparkle and Rainbows. There were the storybook CDs published around that time, and are even available on YouTube to listen to. Huge thanks to the person who ripped these. Unfortunately, they're in Dutch, so I can't really speak on any of the plot, but again, it's cool that they were preserved. German audio cassettes. German audio cassettes are similar to the Dutch CDs. Unfortunately, these are so obscure that there isn't a lot of info about them, nor could I find any rips online. Unreleased playsets. The My Little Wiki refers to a few obscure, unreleased G2 playsets. The first is the Fairy Tale Tower with Petal Blossom. There would also have been holiday playsets featuring baby ponies. It's so obscure that information about it isn't readily available. And that is the My Little Pony G2 Iceberg. My big takeaway from this was how well documented all the stuff here is. I was genuinely surprised to find in-depth resources since, you know, G2 wasn't that popular, yada yada yada. Special shout out again to the My Little Wiki, Lavender Lagoon, Sun Sparkle and Rainbows, and the G3 Fandom Wiki. Yeah, a fandom wiki page that's useful, can you guys believe it? But that's it for me. Before I sign off, I just want to give a special shout out to my Act 3 supporters on Patreon. Jesse Ball, I've Got Frostbite, Kaylee Lahoda, Rosa, Grimmamurk, Shadewalker, Knife Girl, the Blazing Pegasus, Technicolor, Jack Getchman, Paisley, Trixie Best, No Yak Best, Olive, SR Nano, Allison Madden, Johnny Punch Fist, A Kawaii Dragon, Keaton Cryer, Cascadiarch, Damian, Marshmallow, and Goose Nerd. I can't think of a better outro, so until next time, goodbye. Well, I guess it's time for another iceberg. Today's iceberg is going to be all about the third generation of My Little Pony. Not to be confused with G4, the one that spawned the whole brony subculture, or the upcoming G5, G3 was an iteration of My Little Pony lasting from around 2003 to 2010. Most material for G3 was put out on home video and not aired on television until the 2010s. Notable specials and shorts include The Princess Promenade, Pinkie Pie and the Ladybug Jamboree, Newborn Cuties, and A Very Minty Christmas. In the heyday of the Brony fandom, people liked to disregard G3 a lot because it didn't live up to the quality that G4 or Friendship is Magic had. Personally, I kinda like it, at least the early stuff up until 2007. It's obviously for very small children, even more so as it went on, but it has a really nostalgic feeling to it, even if I didn't watch any of the specials as a kid. It's fun, lighthearted, and really easygoing. Don't go into it looking for anything deep, but if you're one of those people with a fondness for quaint little kids media, you might want to give it a try. That being said, let's take a deep dive into this iceberg. I won't be explaining how this works because it's been over a year since the Mario 64 video was published and I won't waste your time explaining something that everybody knows. You know who you are. Anyway, here it is. I know it looks kind of barren, but trust me, there's a lot to cover here. Looking in Google Docs, it has like 2,000 more words than the My Little Ponytails iceberg, and some of the levels alone are like 12 minutes of recording in Audacity. Sit tight and grab your rainbow berry pie and chocolate chip checkers, because we're gonna take a deep dive into the My Little Pony Generation 3 iceberg. Starting with... Level 1, The Sky. Let's start off with Layer 1. I mean, realistically, where else would we? This layer encompasses everything that your average fan of My Little Pony might know about G3, plus some other minor details. Brony hate. I already mentioned this in the intro, but Bronies didn't like G3. They didn't like most of the earlier generations, but G3 was the one that a lot of people downright hated. Mostly because it wasn't made with adults in mind. If they didn't personally enjoy it, it had to be objectively bad. Rainbow Dash always dresses in style. 
This refers to a line in the G3 theme song and also the personality that Rainbow Dash had in G3, which is almost the complete opposite of her G4 counterpart. In G4, Rainbow Dash is a sporty pegasus who loves to fly. In G3, Rainbow Dash is an earth pony who speaks in a British accent and has an interest in fashion. If anything, the G4 version of Rarity is closer to the original Rainbow Dash than the version of her in G4. Webisodes in 2009, a couple of webisodes were released as part of G3.5, which simplified the character designs and changed up a few of the characters' personalities. There are only two, being Sweetie Belle's Gumball House Surprise and Pinkie Pie's Ferris Wheel Adventure. There is no record, at least to my knowledge, of these being available online, only on DVD. So, my little wiki could be lying about that, or inaccurate, or I could be... dumb. Returning Ponies This is gonna be a thing in every iceberg that isn't about G4, G3 had a few ponies that were carried over from G1, which was the original version of MLP from the 1980s. Minty, Applejack, and Twilight are a few. The main six ponies in G4 are all based on G3 ponies as well, with obvious changes in character design and in personality. Other characters like Sweetie Belle, Scootaloo, and Cheerilee also come back from G4 and are the closest to their G3 counterparts. In both G3.5 and in G4, Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo are significantly younger than the rest of the main characters. Cheerilee is a schoolteacher in G4, playing a maternal role for the two. This is a carryover from G3 when Cheerilee was Scootaloo's older sister. This also spawned the fan theory that Cheerilee was Scootaloo's real mother, and had to give the baby away for whatever reason. Similar to the Sweetie Belle being Rarity's daughter theory from the first iceberg I did. Those aren't the only G4 ponies who share names with G3 ones, but if I listed all of them, we'd be here all day. The only pony from G3 that you can say is coming back for Generation 5 is Alphabiddle, who in G3 looked like this, but in G5 looks like this. There are also three ponies with Sunny in their name, Sunny Days, Sunny Salsa, and Sunny Sparkles. So you can take your guess for which one, if any of them, that Sunny Star Scout is based on. Newborn Cuties Newborn Cuties is a spin-off of G3.5, which is itself a spin-off of G3. In Newborn Cuties, the characters are aged down to be infants. The shorts for this line of ponies are noticeably low quality, with cheap flash animation and voice actors who are probably just the producer's kids that they dragged on to be in them. Minty Pie Minty Pie refers to a ship between the characters of Minty and Pinkie Pie. The two are commonly seen together, like in Comeback Lily Lightly and A Very Minty Christmas. Their close friendship leads a few people to ship them together, and I don't object to it, I think they're cute. Cutie Mark Origins From Generation 1 to Generation 3, the symbols on the pony's flanks didn't have a name. They were either called just that, symbols, or rump designs. Generation 3 was the first instance of the term Cutie Mark being used for the symbols, which in G3 is fun and catchy and works with the girly branding, but it's kinda questionable in G4, being as high fantasy and lore heavy as it is. G3 Style Crossover Ponies in the late 2010s till now, Hasbro started making these crossover ponies as collector's items, with properties like Transformers, Dungeons and & Dragons, and Stranger Things. Though some are made in the style of G1, a few of these resemble the G3 models more, like Plasmine, the Ghostbuster pony. Bet you can't make a face crazier than this! This is a line from the episode Too Many Pinkie Pies, from G4, where that version of Pinkie Pie morphs her face into the G3 design for a quick gag. Possibly as a knock at G3, since again, fans of G4 really didn't like it. Gibberish Names If you go onto any database for G3 ponies, you'll start to notice that a lot of the names don't make sense. G1 names are stuff like Fizzy, Cotton Candy, Wind Whistler, and Bowtie, just cute stuff. G4 names are like Sunset Shimmer, Trixie Lulamoon, Fancy Cosmic Sounding names, or more often stuff with a first and last name like Lyra Heartstrings or Photo Finish. But G3 names? Uh, let me read you some of them. Bebop, Bright Sprightly, Blushy, Cheerly, Fluffaluff, Giggle Bean, Goody Goody, Guava Lava, Hokey Pokey, Hula Lula, Jolly Lolly, Keen Bean, Lolly Giggle, Loop Dee Da, Pinkie Pie, Romparoonie, Razaroo, Swirly Pop, Tinka Tinka Too, Toodaloo, Tralala, Twirl Arena, Wish A Whirl, and Zipsy. There are a lot of names that are normal in G3, but those stand out just because there are so many of them. And a lot of these characters I listed here are protagonists in the specials and shorts. And that's not a bad thing. I'm kinda kissing G3's flank in this video already, but as somebody who makes us ease, I love it whenever people take the opportunity to give characters just the stupidest sounding names, like the guys from Hell of a Boss, or something else I forgot I was gonna bring up. Santa Claus is canon. I already talked about this in the first iceberg, but the ponies in G3 celebrate Christmas, meaning that Jesus in some form exists in the pony world. I doubt it's Pony Jesus though, 
Since Santa Claus is implied to be human, and as we'll see, a lot of the ponies' names are based on real-world foreign locations. G3 probably takes place in our world, meaning that there will be human Jesus. Now that I mention it, G3 taking place in the real world, or like, being in the same continuity as G1, which also took place in the real world, that should have been its own entry. G4 voice actors. Yeah, another one that was also on the My Little Pony Tales iceberg. Though some My Little Pony Tales voice actors had minor roles or cameos in G4, a lot of the cast in Friendship is Magic are direct holdovers. Tabitha St. Germain, who voices Minty, also did the voice for G4's Rarity, Princess Luna, and Derpy. In fact, Derpy's voice in a few appearances was modeled after Tabitha's performance as Minty. Kathleen Barr, who played Kimono, as well as doing voiceovers for G3, voiced Trixie in G4. Kelly Sheridan, who played Cheerily, went on to voice star like Glimmer in G4, Andrea Libman, Brian Drummond, and one more we'll get to later also had roles in both versions of MLP. Watching it do what? This is a line from the movie A Twinkle Wish Adventure, where the mayor of Ponyville mentions how she's watching her figure, and Sweetie Belle replies with, watching it do what? This got shared around a few times, not to the effect of anything like the volcano scene from My Little Pony Tales, but I've still seen it in a few places. I guess this might make some people lighten up towards G3.5, since it's a pretty funny joke. But the movie it comes from is one of my least favorites. People like to make fun of G3 and say it's made for babies, but Twinkle Wish Adventure is literally made for babies. It's so bad. Level 2, Tip of the Iceberg. G3.0 versus Core 7. People split up Generation 3 into two parts, G3 and G3.5, but it actually has three phases. In around 2006, the tie-in shorts started to focus around these seven ponies exclusively. Pinkie Pie, Scootaloo, Tularula, Rainbow Dash, Sweetie Belle, Cheerily, and Star Song. This phase of G3 was relegated to shorts, with two of those, Pinkie Pie's Special Day and Rainbow Dash's Special Day, being clip shows. This set of characters would also be the main set of ponies used in G3.5. Hawaiian Pony Names We've already talked about Hula Lula, but there are some other ponies with names based on the Hawaiian language. Aloha Pearl, Luau, and Honolulu are three examples. Butterfly Island itself, the Pegasus homeland, is also modeled after Hawaii and other Pacific Islands. And you've got other ponies like Coconut Cream, Coconut Grove, Pineapple Paradise, and a ton with palm trees for cutie marks. G3 actually had a lot of foreign inspiration for their ponies, as we'll see later down the iceberg. Some of them were more popular than others. Spike voiced Rarity Another returning actress for Generation 4 was Kathy Westluck, who voiced Rarity the Unicorn in G3. In the G4 TV series, she voices Spike the Baby Dragon, a character who has a crush on a unicorn named Rarity. Could this be a subtle nod by the casting director or something? Probably not, but it's fun to think about. Daisy Joe the Cow there's a pony named Daisy Joe who also appears in the few specials as a background pony, and who I happen to own a figure of. In Generation 4, one of the cows in the episode Apple Buck Season goes by the name of Daisy Joe. Another reference to G3, among the many others in the G4 series. Animation Style Change This actually isn't about G3.5, but more about how the animation in G3 went from solid colors to a more shaded look as it went on. Sort of like all those Disney DVD covers, but in motion. The animation in the first few specials is actually really fluid for some reason, like in A Charming Birthday. Spike's full name. Spike the Dragon is a recurring character throughout the entire My Little Pony franchise. He appeared in G1, G4, and arguably in G2, but they never specified who this unnamed dragon was supposed to be. In G3, Spike plays the role of a wise old royal dignitary. His full name is Master Kenbroth Killspot and Heath Spike. It's not really an unknown piece of trivia, he says it like seven times, but it's interesting. Do you think the Spike in G1 or G4 has the same name? G1 Spike was raised to be a member of the villain t rex evil army, and G4 Spike was hatched by the unicorn Twilight Sparkle, so it's less likely. First 50. This refers to an event that was held at the very beginning of G3, in 2003, 2004, and in 2005. The first 50 of every different pony off the production line would be auctioned off by eBay in partnership with Hasbro. This was way before they were available in stores, around a couple months. These first 50 edition ponies go for significantly more at resale and came with special certificates and stickers. The promotion included around 38 ponies over the three years, including ponies like Minty, Kimono, Rainbow Dash, and Thistle Whistle. Nintendo Console Games 
To the dismay of a lot of fans, G4 was the only version of My Little Pony to receive video games on any official home console. Well, handhelds, but you know. Those being the Game Boy Advance game based on the Runaway Rainbow, and Pinkie Pie's Party on the DS. Both of these were published by THQ, who you may recognize if you grew up with any Nintendo system in the 2000s. Basically every licensed game for a movie, TV show, toy was put up by these guys. Hopefully if I'm able to find gameplay of these two, that's what you've been seeing so far in the background. Yeah, that's right, I've ripped off LS Mark, Pat Mac, Rebel Taxi, now we're doing Dr. Skipper. Now all I need is a guest star. Both of these games are minigame collections with a story mode, so Runaway Rainbows is more in-depth, as it actually follows the plot of the special, and you get to walk around more outside of the minigames. That's the second layer of the iceberg. We'll get into stuff that collectors of the toy line, and also what you could consider hardcore G3 fans will recognize. Level 3 Magnetic Hooves Certain G3 ponies would have magnets on the bottom of their hooves, as noted by this heart symbol. This would be used to activate little features in certain playsets like the Crystal Castle. Think of it like if you ever played with the Maginex as a kid, and you'd have the little things that turn their feet. Apparently, the ponies' hooves stopped having magnets on them after 2007. This was because parents complained about kids swallowing them. Yikes. The Pony Project. I spent a good 30 minutes writing about this, and then I realized it probably would have been too long to fit into this iceberg, so that's going to be a part of a different video about custom MLP figures. All you need to know, it's an art exhibition charity auction thing with big 18-inch fancy pony statues. Minty's Socks. The character Minty is shown to have a lot of socks. It's never known why she likes socks so much, but the Unsolved Mysteries section on the My Little Pony G3 wiki says that it could be because she got a pair of green socks for Christmas one year, giving her a reason to love both socks and the color green. Starcatcher Trans Pride. Oh great, here she goes with this again. Starcatcher is a Pegasus pony that appears in Dancing in the Clouds, Friends Are Never Far Away, and A Very Minty Christmas. Her color scheme of white, light pink, and light blue is similar to the transgender pride flag designed by Monica Helms in 1999. In the storybook Bell of the Ball, Starcatcher is incorrectly labeled as a boy. Was this an instance of misgendering her? Or calling them by preferred pronouns? And no, people in the comments, I don't mean that seriously, slash HJ, alright? PC games. Besides the two console games, G3 had a few games for the PC. The My Little Pony PC Play Pack was published by Atari in 2004, and came with an exclusive figure of Baby Sparkleberry Swirl. Pinkie Pie's Party Parade was published by THQ in 2007, which, unlike the name suggests, isn't the port of the DS game. Both of those two are minigame collections, just like the Nintendo games. Prototype Pinkie Pie in 2003 Magazine Although Pinkie Pie, as the name suggests, is pink in all of her media appearances, one My Little Pony magazine available in 2003 shows what could possibly be a prototype model for the character. The hair color seems to be the same, but instead of pink, her coat is purple. I don't know how this happened. This specific catalog was available the same year as the first wave of G3 toys came out. So Pinky actually being pink might have been a last minute decision, or a beta version of Pinky could have accidentally been used instead of the final one. Pinky Squinks. Since we're already talking about Pinky Pie, in the short Pinkie Pie and the Ladybug Jamboree, Pinkie Pie performs what's called a Pinky Squink, where she squats down, flips her hair back and forth like Willow Smith, and winks. This projects an image of whatever she's thinking about in front of every other pony, and is accompanied by magic sparkles. It also gives her the ability to come up with new ideas, like what act to perform for the music festival in said short. Fans of G4 might recognize this. In G4, Pinkie Pie has her pinky sense where she can predict disasters before they happen by twitching her tail. This is even shown in the original 2008 animation test for G4, which makes me believe that it might not have been something that they consciously carried over from G3 and just a coincidence. Most of the early storylines in G4 came from Lord Faust's childhood and the stories that she would make up while playing with her My Little Pony toys, possibly including the one with her pinky sense. But I don't know, you're free to prove me wrong in the comments. G3.5 and FIM style overlap. There isn't really a whole lot to say about this. G3.5 and G4 look pretty alike. The pony snouts are both way smaller than actual horses, and their eyes are way too big. Again, going back to Lauren Faust, this overlap could have been because Hasbro gave her notes on what they wanted the ponies to look like, either that or it was just her art style. Dance Studio and Other Flash Games 
G3 had console games, PC disc based games, as well as games that you could play on the official My Little Pony website. Rainbow Wishes Roller Coaster is a game based on the short Dancing in the Clouds, where you catch butterflies while riding on a pre rendered roller coaster track. Butterfly Island Adventure has you playing mini games in order to collect flowers to make a necklace. There's also a matching game, which is exactly what it sounds like. Dance Studio was a game where you could program your own dance routines for the ponies to perform. The dance one is the most notable because there was a user on TikTok in 2020 who would use the Dance Studio game to make ponies dance to popular songs like WAP by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Comic Books If you look up G3 scans online, you'll find a few of these comics. These were published in the My Little Pony annual magazine, I'm guessing from 2004 to 2007. As much as I'd like to go into excruciating detail about them, these are kind of hard to come by online, only on a few Tumblr blogs which don't really give any information on who wrote them or did the art. That's a shame, these are some of my favorite pieces of G3 media. They're not laugh out loud funny or all that interesting, but they have some cute moments. And I really like the art style that they go for. There's one where the ponies go sledding and Rainbow Dash eats one where Pinkie Pie becomes a muse to this unicorn painter, one where Fizzy Pop tries to walk on a homemade tightrope, one where Rainbow Dash teaches the other ponies how to paint, and one where a few ponies have a tea party, with all the others making excuses not to eat this one's food. If you want to read these, I'm going to link all the ones I found in the description. Other than that, there are other ones I can assume you can find by buying the actual physical magazines. Ethan Tove's Orchestral Arrangements Ethan Tove's is an American composer who arranges pieces for concerts as well as other media. According to the About page on his website, most of his music is inspired by themes of nature or childhood. Being a big fan of MLP, he's composed several fan songs as well as orchestral and choral arrangements for most of the songs from G3. These are all super good, and again, I'm gonna link his channel in the description so you can listen to them. G3 getting this much love isn't something you see often, especially something as cool and professional as this. Comic Con Exclusives Before G4 took off and we got SDCC exclusive figures like the official Derpy Hooves brushable, Hasbro put out a few Comic-Con exclusives for collectors in the late 2000s. This, as well as the Pony Project, kind of goes in line with the vinyl art scene that started to get big in the 2000s. Fans of Rebel Taxi will kinda know what I'm talking about. Vinyl figures now are seen as cheap, bottom-of-the-barrel collectibles for normies, but back in the 2000s and early 2010s, specially designed vinyls were a big thing among artists. Ponies that were made include a ninja pony and two superhero ponies, you also had ponies with designs inspired by graffiti art, and a solid black and white pony, with symbols all over the coat. These all came in these square collector boxes that we'll see later down the iceberg when we talk about a different convention. Surprisingly, they're not that expensive, only going for around $50 on eBay. Alright, level 3 is over, but that doesn't mean we're completely into the depths. Layer 4 this level, surprisingly, still has things that people with somewhat of a passing knowledge on G3 will recognize or understand. But we're getting a lot more deep cuts here. 3D Cutie Marks Ponies with 3D symbols is something that Hasbro experimented with starting in 2005 and ending in 2007. These were under two lines, Dream Design Ponies and Crystal Design Ponies. The crystals were different from the others in that their cutie marks were translucent. 29 ponies were released under both lines, with most of them being crystals. Pinkie Pie's mother. Ugh, oh, I hate your mom. Dun dun dun, JK, she's a milf. Can we have a sleepover? No, I don't wanna f your mom. JK, she's a milf. Yeah. But yeah, Pinkie Pie's mom appears in Newborn Cuties. She has a Karen haircut. Minty falls to her death. This refers to a scene in A Very Minty Christmas where Minty falls out of a balloon before being saved by some pegasi. This is probably the most intense moment in all of G3, along with the waterfall scene from Runaway Rainbow. There could also be a theory that Minty didn't get carried away in time and is now in a coma or something. The World's Biggest Tea Party According to Wikipedia, quote, My Little Pony Live, The World's Biggest Tea Party is a 2006 musical based on the My Little Pony franchise by Hasbro. The musical is produced by the VEE Corporation under the direction of Richard Thompson and Vincent Egan. The musical first began in October 2006 and later concluded its performance in 2008. The musical was released on DVD by Paramount Home Entertainment on September 16, 2008 and was filmed at the Kodak Theater. All shows were performed to a pre-recorded soundtrack." End quote. 
The show was performed using these uncanny looking MLP mascot costumes. And not only did it have most of the pony characters from the 03 to 06 run of specials, but it also featured some ladybug characters, Spike the Dragon, and the three breezy ponies, Zipsy, Tralala, and Tiddlywink. Since they were smaller, the breezies were performed by puppeteers on sticks from behind whatever this is. The show had a simple plot, with the ponies being bored and deciding to throw a big tea party. Most of the show's songs are original, with some being borrowed from the specials and shorts. Unicorn Cheerily Kirli is a character that appears in every iteration of G3, but she did change species when the Core 7 reboot came out. In The Runaway Rainbow from 2006, Kirli is one of the four crystal princesses who needs to raise the rainbow and serves as a mentor to Rarity who has to teach her to use the magic wand. One thing that carries over from every version of Kirli, even in G4, is her having this sort of mentor role which I mentioned earlier. In G3.5 and the Core 7 shorts, she likes to tell stories, and in G4, she's Ponyville's resident school teacher. Anthro Figures This refers to the Ponyville line of ponies and playsets released in the late 2000s. Though most of the ponies are smaller versions of their G3.5 figures with molded hair, a few of them wear clothes and stand on two legs like this Sing and Dance Star song and the Sweetie Belle figure in the Cafe Sweet Shop playset. This isn't the only time that MLP would do anthropomorphized ponies. In 2020, during G4.5, Hasbro made the Smash and Fashion line of ponies that stood on two legs and could wear clothes that came in these little surprise bags. My Little Pony Fair My Little Pony Fair was an event that was held from 2004 until 2019. The first one was held around August 2nd to 3rd, possibly in line with International Pony Day, which is August 1st. Unlike pony conventions that would pop up in the 2010s, this set of fairs was for collectors and fans of the toys, both young and old. There's no set location for My Little Pony Fair. Having first been held in Las Vegas, then Minnesota, then San Francisco, and somewhere different every following year. The first few were centered around G1 to G3, obviously, with G4 stuff coming in around 2012. Starting with Pony Fair 2005, exclusive ponies could be bought by guests who attended. These exclusives are similar to the G3 Comic Con ponies in style, with the square boxes and fancy designs. The G4 Pony Fair ponies would be more elaborate, like this Discord and Fluttershy set, and this Maniac and Spike set. My Little Pony Fair 2020 and 2021 were put on hold due to the pandemic, but the 2021 convention still has a chance of happening and being rescheduled. Collector websites. In the same league as the old pony fairs, collector websites are something that emerged in the late 90s and 2000s for people to show off their pony collections or to catalog an official list of ponies. A lot of these are down or haven't been updated in a while, but some are still up and running, even updating with G4 and G5. Sites like this were actually a helpful resource for identifying ponies for this video. Earth Pony Starcatcher. Though Starcatcher is a Pegasus Pony, in one of the later specials apparently she appears as an Earth Pony for a few scenes. I thought this was in a very minty Christmas, but no, she's a Pegasus in that. All Female Society Speaking of a very minty Christmas, in that one of the songs has the lyric, Every Boy and Girl. But there are no boy ponies in the entirety of Ponyville. The only male character in all of G3 that I know of is Spike. In a Twinkle Wish adventure, a pony that's believed to be a boy appears in one of the crowd shots, but that's debatable. So, where are the boys? How do the ponies reproduce? Well, we'll cover that when we get to the G1 iceberg. Disney Princess Crossover In 2004, the shop Once Upon a Toy Store in downtown Disney Orlando and California featured these exclusive ponies. They were the same as the regular versions of them, Minty, Kimono, Pinkie Pie, and Sparkle Works, but came with an exclusive cape and hat. Each one of them is labeled as dressing up as a certain Disney princess, Belle, Ariel, Cinderella, and Aurora respectively. These were also available through Disney's mail order service, and now go for around $50 mint in box. Fiesta Flair. This is an interesting one. Fiesta Flair is a pony that appeared in the short Pinkie Pie and the Ladybug Jamboree. Unlike other ponies in Ponyville, she speaks in a Latin American accent. Allegedly this, combined with her name and the fact that she plays the maracas, led her not to get a toy made of her. It's speculated that Hasbro might have thought her character was a stereotype of Mexican people and didn't want the toy to cause any controversy. Some even like to theorize that the maracas on her cutie mark were repurposed into candy apples, and she was creatively renamed and re-released as, get this, Candy Apple. But we don't know any of that for sure. She never made any other appearances, except in a Twinkle Wish adventure as a background pony. 
G3.5 is a prequel. In G3.5, a few of the characters are significantly younger than how they appear in G3, so that might mean that G3.5 is a prequel. It's more likely that it's just a different continuity, though. Alternate Intro The version of the G3 intro that everyone knows didn't show up until the Core 7 reboot, though there is a version of the classic My Little Pony intro that shows up in the My Little Pony live show. This version doesn't add any other melodies or verses, and is just a reworking of the G1 theme with some different lyrics. Latin America Exclusives There were a few G3 ponies that were exclusive to regions in Central and South America. These Brazilian ponies are nicknamed Baby Zillas on the My Little Wiki, and seem to be versions of some of the G3 characters with different proportions, mainly a larger head. In Mexico, there were a few ponies that were labeled as collectible. They reportedly used a harder type of plastic than the other ponies, and came with your typical MLP accessories, like a comb. Tularula Celtic Origins The Tularula that most fans know appears in the Core 7 shorts and in G3.5. But earlier in G3, there was a pony named Tularula with an entirely different color scheme and cutie mark. Her original cutie mark was based on a Celtic symbol called a triskelly. Triskelly? This Celtic influence extends to her name. Tularula derives from the song Tura Lura Tura Lura A, also known as That's an Irish Lullaby. In her later redesign, the swirls on her symbol were repurposed to be drawn by a paintbrush. Dragonite. Whimsy Weatherby is a dragon character who appears in a Twinkle Wish adventure. She has the ability to change the weather with her breath and serves as a special antagonist. According to the trivia page for G3 on TV Tropes, she's sometimes referred to as Dragonite, due to her appearance and the fact that she's a dragon. When I read this for the first time, I thought this was talking about a pony with a similar color scheme, but no. Plug and Play Game Plug and Play TV games were all the rage in the 2000s. Just plug the game into the AV port, then play. Simple as that. I always wanted the Spongebob one as a kid, but what I eventually ended up with was this Namco one that we got like years later. Anyways, the game featured an exclusive pony named Puzzlement, and was, get this, another minigame collection. Players would have completed tasks around Ponyville in order to earn puzzle pieces that they would then have to use at the end of the game to make a puzzle. The game also had voice clips from the actors including Kathleen Barr, Andrea Lindman, and Tabitha St. Germain. It's cool that they made one of these, and I want to see if I could ever find it someday, but compared to all the other neat plug-and-play consoles, this one looks super lame. Would it have bothered them that much to make this thing a pony's face, or the logo, or even like a horseshoe or something interesting? It's just a boring patch of grass. Ribbons and Hearts Ribbons and Hearts, not to be confused with Baby Ribbons and Hearts from G1, or Ribbon Heart from G4, is the name of an unreleased pony that would have been released for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Though it was never sold at any convention or event, it reportedly showed up at an eBay auction in 2010, and was sold in China. Another thing to note was the pony also has a 3D cutie mark, like the ones I mentioned earlier. And yes, before somebody comments, I know that they had 3D cutie marks in G1. Desert Rose Salami Desert Rose is a pretty unremarkable G3 pony. She had a background role in Dancing in the Clouds, A Very Minty Christmas, The Princess Promenade, and Twinkle Wish Adventure. She appeared in a storybook, a few pieces of merchandise, and this. This My Little Pony branded salami, or Meat Versti, or Medwurst, or whatever, it's, it's fake, but it fooled me. The idea that in the Netherlands, the text on the package is Dutch, there was once My Little Pony branded lunch meat isn't the craziest thing to believe, but not only does looking up My Little Pony salami in English and in Dutch yield only one result for this image, and no other instances of pony meat, it's painfully obvious that this is photoshopped. I mean, look at this. I even put this meme featuring the image in the first My Little Pony iceberg under the guise of it being real. But if it was real, this would be way further down the iceberg. Speaking of, let's move on to the fifth layer. Layer 5 More of the same on this layer, except you can start to see more crack theories and more obscure information pop up. If you couldn't tell, we're getting pretty deep. Green-haired Minty concept art. Minty originally was one of the main six ponies in the 1982 run of the My Little Pony figures, designed by Bonnie Zachary. There, she had a green coat, white hair, and blue eyes. <laughs> originally, her G3 redesign was going to be similar. Concept art posted on the My Little Pony G3 wiki shows Minty with the green mane and eyes that look slightly bluer than with the final purple color that they went with. There is no source for this concept art, making it possible that this is just some guy on the G3 wiki making stuff up to sound interesting. Put a pin in that. 
This was suggested by somebody in one of the community posts. Apparently, there's a poly ship between Zipsy, Tiddlywinks, and Tralala. Not much to say, but it did remind me of the time I used to use Amino, and I went on what I thought was the Heather's Amino, but then the only thing people would talk about on there was polyamorous ships, and I went out and it turns it was the polyamorous Heather ship Amino. Pink is a language. In the Twinkle Wish Adventure movie, Pinkie Pie is able to talk with a group of butterflies who show her the way to Whimsy's hideout. When asked how she's able to do this, she says that she can speak pink. Again, a pretty funny joke in a not-so-good movie, but yeah, pink is a language. Ponyville is an LPS ripoff. I don't know much about LPS, so don't crucify me if I get anything wrong about this. Littlest Pet Shop was a toy franchise that began in the early 90s and is still going today. The 2005 relaunch of the franchise is the most culturally relevant, having spawned a large community online in the 2010s. In the late 2000s, the franchise was incredibly popular. As somebody who grew up in that era, I should know. Tiny animal figures with big eyes that inhabited these elaborate high-concept playsets. Around this time is when the Ponyville line of MLP toys came out, which featured, get this, tiny pony figures with big eyes that inhabited these large, elaborate, high-concept playsets. So, would this mean that Hasbro was ripping off their own toy line? Again, one for the G1 iceberg and later down here, Hasbro doesn't have an original bone in their body when it comes to marketing the MLP franchise past the 80s. That's What I Love About Christmas alternate version. That's What I Love About Christmas is a song that's sung by Minty in A Very Minty Christmas. The song has an alternate version that's sung by Kathleen Barr in the end credit, while the original version that Minty sings is performed in character by Tabitha St. Germain. The end credits version is infinitely better, having different lyrics and actually staying on beat with the song. The original, Minty just sing talks more than she actually sings. It's from Paris. This is a line in the clip show short, Rainbow Dash's Special Day. In it, the other ponies get Rainbow Dash to come outside by telling her she has a package from Paris, France. Further cementing my theory that Ponyland is part of our world, the way it is in G1. Cookie Censorship This refers to a change made to the Core 7 MLP intro between G3 and G3.5. In the G3 version, Sweetie Belle holds out a plate of cookies that she baked for the other ponies. In G3.5, the cookies are replaced by fruit. I'm gonna guess that this was to promote healthy eating. You can't really get mad at it, but it's such a weird minor detail that they bothered changing. Looks like Michelle Obama couldn't even leave Ponyville alone. Blind Bags Late in G3.5, Hasbro started putting out these blind bags. You could get both opaque and transparent miniature ponies, as well as these mermaid ponies, which are exclusive to them. These are similar to the ones that they did early in G4 and continue to do even now with these miniature pony life and upcoming G5 ponies. While writing this, I was gonna go on a mini rant about blind bags and mystery surprise toys, but just like the pony project, that's gonna be its own video, because trust me, I've got a lot to say. G3.5 narrated by Core 7 Kirli. This is a theory that G3.5 and the stories that happened in that era are actually being told by Kirli from the normal G3. This would explain the more lighthearted and simple nature of the stories, like Twinkle Wish Adventure. Although, the voice actress who narrated the movie plays the mayor, not Kirli. Anna Cummer. Hey guys, Rainbow Dash here. Please do not look up who voiced me in the 2009 straight to DVD movie My Little Pony at Twinkle Wish Adventure. Double Hoof Hearts. In G3, ponies have heart symbols printed on their hooves. Usually this was to show which hoof had the magnet on it. In the same catalog with the purple Pinkie Pie, the ponies actually have a different symbol, with a smaller heart above the normal one, like that one emoji. Spike is a reincarnated pony princess. This is a theory that Spike the Dragon is actually the reincarnation of a long-dead pony princess, or maybe a pony princess who got turned into a dragon. This is because of his knowledge of, like, royal stuff, as well as him saying that he'd want to be a princess. When Spike is first woken up, he references the fairy tale of a princess and the frog, wherein a prince gets turned into a frog and needs to be kissed by a princess to turn him back into a human, which could be evidence to the turned into a dragon theory. Another minor thing to note is that the area outside the castle that Spike is buried in is similar to the cave in the G1 arc, Quest of the Princess Ponies. That cave is also outside of a castle in Royal Paradise, which is an oasis-type area where the princess ponies, who control all of Ponyland's magic, live. Lair 6 I forgot to write anything for the intro to this layer, so let's get right into it. Ponyland is a communist utopia. Disclaimer, I'm not endorsing any specific ideologies with this entry, I just thought it was an interesting theory. 
The International Workers' Press describes the idea of communism as a classless, moneyless, stateless society. Throughout G3, we can see that the ponies don't have any form of currency. Never in G3 are any of the ponies charged for any of the goods and or services throughout Ponyville. Examples include the bakery and salon in A Charming Birthday and Princess Promenade, respectively. There seems to be no distinction between the common pony and those seemingly at a higher social status. The Crystal Princesses are nothing but figureheads with no real political power who are appointed temporarily. Same goes for things like certain ponies being in charge of certain ceremonies. In the Princess Promenade, Wisteria rejects the idea of ruling over other ponies, and everyone is declared as equal. There's essentially no government in any of the pony societies. The only thing separating the Pegasus homeland of Butterfly Island from the Earth Pony homeland of Ponyville and the Unicorn homeland of Unicornia is distance. Many of the specials include the idea of uniting all three different kinds of ponies. The world in G3, as a result, could be seen by some viewers as the ideal communist society. Made in response to Barbie straight-to-DVD movies. In the 80s and into the 90s, if you wanted to sell a toy, you'd put a cartoon on TV. In the 2000s, it was different. The emerging market for DVDs led a lot of toy companies to produce straight-to-video tie-ins instead of investing the money in a full TV series. American Girl, Bionicle, Bratz, Strawberry Shortcake, Care Bears, and most notably, Barbie. As you can tell, most of these are girls' aisle toys. The first MLP special in the G3 series, A Charming Birthday, was released in 2003. Two years after the first of the CGI Barbie series, which came out in 2001. Plans for G3 Media were made before this point, but we'll be talking about that pretty soon. The Breezy Hive Mind. This is a theory that all of the breezes that we see in the Princess Promenade and Runaway Rainbow are part of a subconscious hive mind, because, you know, they're bugs. A big piece of evidence for this theory is the running gag of them doing everything together. Also, how they'll rub their antennas together when they figure something out. Almost like they're communicating information to the rest of the hive. Core 7 represents 7 deadly sins. Oh my god, this again. If you couldn't tell already, the iceberg is kind of bare in some sections. I really had to go digging for info to fill a lot of these out. Just like the Tails one, I put this one in here because it sounds like one of those spooky iceberg things. Icebergs in general, though, have sort of shifted away from that to talking about real information and more interesting theories that make you think. It's a double-edged sword, because that means while you do have a lot of icebergs where people have to actually dig up interesting info, you also have ones that aren't mysterious or creepy at all, and just really boring. That goes in both ways, though, because if all the creepy stuff is the same in everyone, it can get really boring, too. I don't know. That was the big appeal of the Mario 64 one to some people, and I miss when iceberg videos weren't just a 2020 equivalent to a top 10 list. It was a new format for both genuinely interesting trivia and creepy stuff to be confined in one video. I love videos about both of those things, so it's the perfect format for people like me. The better ones are so long and dense too. You can watch or listen to them while playing a game or drawing or taking a walk or whatever. Such a rich experience. But now, you know what I hate about newer iceberg videos, or just all iceberg videos? When the person who's talking doesn't stay on topic. G5 is a G3 remake. It always comes back to Chris Chan, huh? Well, not really. While G5 is a G3 remake might sound like somebody coping with G5 coming out by dunking on it, the statement actually holds some ground. Consider my theory I proposed in the second My Little Pony Iceberg. That theory states that G4 is part of a branching timeline that ends with G3 in one instance. In that theory, the Pegasus, Unicorn, and Earth Ponies coming to live together in G3 was after thousands of years of fallout from the bad ending of G4. And what's G5 about? All types of ponies coming together thousands of years after the events of G4. G3 and G5 do have the same place in the timeline, meaning that they could be seen as telling the exact same story. Rainbow Cult This is a theory that the rainbow ceremony in Runaway Rainbow is some sort of a cult ritual. It kind of literally is, since the ponies need to use magic to usher in the rainbow. The way they talk about it in the special though, it seems like rainbows are of some religious significance to Ponyland. If that's the case, then Rainbow Dash's name and obsession with rainbows would make her more pious and interested in fashion. Extending that theory that rainbows are spiritual to ponies, wouldn't that go on to just colors in general? Minty is obsessed with the color green and Pinky is obsessed with the color pink, both of which are colors used by the four unicorn princesses to create the first rainbow of the season. First, MLP Rule 34. While we think of, you know, as the thing that happened as a result of G4's popularity among adult men, material of that nature actually exists on the internet as far back as 2007. I don't encourage anybody, don't look, don't look it up. My Little Pony G3 Theory. 
This was a theory from the Creepypasta staff training wiki that unfortunately got taken down before I was able to look it up. What I remember was the basic idea that G3 was G4's version of heaven. Since it's so peaceful and everybody's problems aren't as significant as the things that happen in G4. G3 is G4 Pinky's imagination. This is in the same boat as the last theory. G3 could possibly be stories that G4's version of Pinkie Pie made up in her head, possibly while she's bored. That's another explanation for G3's tone, but given how off all of the G3 characters are from G4, this maybe could be Season 8 Pinkie Pie's imagination and not, like, Season 2 Pinkie. Maybe this is the humanized Pinkie Pie in G4's Equestria Girl series trying to imagine what the pony world is like. Fallen Order of Ponyland. This is based on the previous theory that Spike is some kind of reincarnated pony princess, who built all these castles that we see in Ponyland. In Unicornia, they have some use, but in Ponyville, they're just there for the ponies to hang out in. The theory goes that the ponies in Ponyville are living among the ruins of some other pony kingdom that fell, possibly among the ruins of Royal Paradise from G1. Not only would that explain the caves under the castle, but also the idea that there needs to be a princess, since the princess ponies, as I mentioned, control all of Ponyland's magic. In G1, there were six princess ponies, all using a different magic wand. You know who has magic wands in G3? The Unicorns. Is it possible that maybe Unicornia is actually the ruins of Royal Paradise? That would make the Ponyville Castle Dream Castle. But if G3 takes place after G1, that would be a stretch, since in the My Little Pony movie from 1986, the ponies gave Dream Castle to the Grundles and moved into Paradise Estate. So that means that all the Grundles would have to be dead, and there would also have to be four wands in G3, but six in G1. This theory is really messy. I don't know where I was going with this. Lost CGI Pilot Reportedly, there was originally a CGI pilot of G3 produced sometime in 2002 by NSKY Studios and shown off at the MIPCOM trade show in October 22nd of that year. The pilot follows the same plot as A Charming Birthday, with the ponies needing to make a gift for Kimono. There's no real footage for this pilot, although you could conclude that footage was reused in a commercial from sometime around 2003. Or, the more likely story, this pilot is a hoax and the commercial footage was used for that and nothing else. Like the green hair minty concept art, there's no source on this. And Sky Studios has no trace on the internet, though it does credit Sparks Media, which does exist to my knowledge. The article on the wiki cites other articles which shows that NSKY produced. Though searching 3 out of 4 of these shows only gives results from fandom wiki articles and nothing else. On all of those other articles, and the article for the CGI G3 pilot, you can see the same person in the comments. In all these comments sections, they appear to be talking in complete nonsense, and in the G3 one, you can see them having random conversations with themselves. Going on the history of these pages reveals that they've been the ones editing all of them. Taking a step further and looking at this user's message wall, you can see people asking further about the G3 pilot, to which they barely respond. This user has apparently been blocked across the fandom network, whatever that means. The fact that somebody can go on these wikis and spread blatantly false information is something that's disappointing, to say the least. First researching this, it had me fooled for a bit, but then going deeper, it's clear that this is a hoax only made for attention. Attention that this person didn't even want, apparently. Shame on you, Mr. Spears. You had me fooled. And you too, Mrs. Spears. Death to all of them. Oh, Cancelled theatrical movie. Do not research. This sounds like another made-up iceberg thing, but this actually has some evidence to it. On this pamphlet from 2003, they mention a My Little Pony movie to be released in theaters in October. It would have held around 1,000 to 1,500 showings before coming to home video and TV. A plot synopsis from Hasbro's website reads, All the ponies in Ponyville are filled with excitement and getting ready for their big day celebrating friendship, but things don't go exactly as planned. In fact, they don't go anywhere near the plan. Join our My Little Pony friends on a high-flying celebration of teamwork, friendship, and love. So Jay, what did you think of- It's speculated that this movie was cancelled for being too ambitious. And I want to add on to that, that maybe it might have been reworked or had its elements used in later G3 media. The plot summary is pretty vague after all and could have worked for a few of the specials. They have a celebration in like every single one. But again, that's speculation. Okay, future me, you're gonna put the My Little Ponytails clip where she says that speculation? Alright, you, you're looking sexy today. Ladybug Song is Psychological Warfare. Yet another one that I got as a comment on a community post. 
The song We're the Ladybugs is notoriously catchy, so much so that people theorize that it could be a form of MK Ultra psychological warfare against the citizens of the United States. G3.75 Another thing I made up for the iceberg chart, well, kind of, this just means the distinction between G3, the Core 7, and G3.5, with there being three phases of the generation. If we're going by that logic, then what we know as G3.5 is actually G3.75. Steve Beaumont Concept Art A post on the MLP Arena forums recounts one concept artist's experience with Hasbro in the late 90s. According to the post, there were a lot of concepts for ponies that we never got to see in G3 including Sea Ponies and a redesign of G1's Majesty. The post reads, Back in 97 to 98, Hasbro asked if I would be interested in having a look at revamping their My Little Pony toys. Well, not just the toys, but to redevelop the look of the ponies. At the time, Japanese animation was already influencing the style of Western animation, so I went off in that direction. This was flat out rejected as it was considered too much of a departure at the time, so I decided to just simply modify the look of the ponies from the current style at the time. The feedback from Hasbro was that they needed to have more edge. I then produced a series of sketches, one of which is shown above, Majesty. Hasbro wasn't sure, but one of the marketing team asked me to look at developing some ideas for one of the collector's pieces. I threw in some iconic film suggestions, such as Edward Scissorhands. They couldn't do these due to the cost implications of buying the rights to the characters, but the sketches were well received, so they asked me to look at similar themes that had no copyright. This is what got me into trouble with Hasbro. For the limited edition collector's pieces, they wanted something a little edgy. I was asked to take it as far as I can. Just run with it. My 80s throwback My Little Goth Pony raised a few eyebrows, but it was My Little Fetish Pony that closed the door at Hasbro. I did get paid though, so it's not a complete tragedy. I'd be showing you more of these, except the website that I was linked to needed me to log in to see the photos, so I did, then it booted me back to the homepage, so I went back to the link I got, but it needed me to log in, so I logged in and it booted me back to the homepage. That's a shame, because this art is super nice. And now that it's brought up, I can really see the anime influence that not only did he go for here, but that G3 would envelop into its style. I mean, look at these eyes. Yet again, I'll be linking to the post so that people in the description can read it, and maybe actually see all of the pictures. That's the iceberg. I'd like to give a big thanks to all the blogs and other resources that helped me compile all this stuff. Heck yeah pony scans, G3 resource, and G3 facts on Tumblr, strawberryreef.com, mlparena.com, the G3 wiki, and my little wiki. I had a lot of fun researching and writing this iceberg. Maybe it's the fact that I get to soak myself in something that isn't G4 or G5, but there were so many interesting little rabbit holes to dive into here. In fact, researching this alone gave me some ideas for some other videos. I'd like to thank everybody who got this far in the video, and ask anybody who hasn't yet to like, subscribe, click the notification bell, and all that good stuff. Comment down below any facts or theories about G3 that I might have missed. Hopefully by the time this video is out, my Patreon page will be fully set up, but if it's not, look out for that. Don't forget to follow me on my other socials linked in the description, and I can't think of a better outro. So until next time, goodbye. <laughs>